to make sure. Is the recorder on? Fantastic. If we could have the members of the public sign in, please. All right. Um, so, calling to order meeting on Wednesday, March 1st, 2023. Secretary, could we call the roll, please? John Miller? Here. Kristen Finn? Here. Anna Saxon? Ivan Heredia? Here. Jim Pichard? Here. Buddy Willis Sampson, Elise Lindstrom? Here. Do we have any changes to the agenda? No, Chair. Fantastic. Someone make a motion to approve? Second. Do we need a roll call on that? John Miller? Yes. Kristen Finn? Yes. Linda Saxon? Ivan Heredia? Yes. Tim Chard? Yes. Buddy willis Absin, Elise Lindstrom? Yes. Can we have an approval of the minutes, January 4th, 2023 minutes? So moved. Second. Kristen Finn, second. John Miller? Yes. Kristen Finn? Yes. Rhonda Saxton? Yes. Ivan Heredia? Yes. Jim Chard? Yes. Audio willis Absin, Elise Lindstrom? Yes. Could we please swear in anyone from the public that wishes to speak? Please raise your right hand by the authority vested in me, the notary of the state of Florida. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. All right. This hearing shall be conducted in accordance with the City of Delray Beach quasi-judicial rules. The applicant and the city shall be permitted to present their case. The public shall be allowed to speak for three minutes each or a maximum of six minutes if the person represents an organization or a group of people who are present but agree not to speak. The City Commission, board members, staff, and the applicant may be allowed to cross-examine a witness. The city or the applicant may be allowed to offer rebuttal testimony. The decision to approve or deny an application or, or appeal may not legally be made upon personal views as to whether a project is a good project or not, nor may a decision be based on the number of citizens who support or oppose a particular project. The law requires that all decisions must be made on the basis of whether the project meets the requirements of the law, the comprehensive plan, and the land development regulations. He could just go back briefly and see if there are any comments from the public related to non-agenda items. That was next on my list. That's number seven. We got to fix your list then. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Can we fix my list? Yes, I will. Okay. Um, are there any comments from the public that are not related to items on the agenda? I'll go with no. Uh, right, into presentations. No presentations. All right, on to quasi-judicial hearing items. Item 8A. Staff, would you read it into the record, please? Hi, I'm Michelle Hoyland for the record. Um, I'm entering file COA 2023-038 into the record. This is actually a certificate Certificate of appropriateness, not a class one site plan modification. We failed to update this cover slide. Um, the applicants uh, and property owner are here and will present first. In the meantime, could we have any ex parte, please? None. 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 I drove by. <laughs> All right, applicant, when you're ready. Okay, and um, please remember to state your name for the record. Just the photo the uh, Go back one. There you go. Roger cannot see. Other way, other way, other way. There you go, there you go. 
Perfect spot. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, for the record, Roger Cope, architect, uh, 701 Southeast First Street in the National Marina Historic District. I'm honored to be here tonight uh, with uh, owner of the property, Mr. Ron Kurzman. He will be uh, my slide man. And I would be remiss if I didn't also include Mr. George Long as our unofficial archivist and historian, <laughs> uh, because George has uh, offered a lot of uh, background information on this structure, uh, including uh, identifying this archival photograph and, and putting it in our hands and a really colorful uh, history that follows. Uh, so that's our team. And of course, at the end of the, the night, we'll make uh, ourselves all available uh, for any questions that you may have. We're going to make this pretty brief. Uh, we, have a, we, we have a glowing staff report, I, I must say. Um, this is a very simple uh, a proposal that's before you. Uh, our goal is to do nothing but bring this building back to the original glory that it was in the day it was built. And we, we believe that to be about 1922. So uh, having said that, I'd also like to thank Michelle uh, Hoyland and her uh, staff, which is Katharina Palawoda and Michelle Hewitt, uh, because they've guided us all along the way and encouraged a pure uh, historic uh, rehabilitation, renovation, restoration, however you want to categorize it. Uh, and they've, uh, they've given us a lot of great guidance and we, we really appreciate that. So the building itself with a little bit of history, this is a great, great photograph. Uh, this is, uh, our, our structure is the structure in the background, not the one in the foreground. The foreground is actually St. Paul's Church. Uh, or uh, a, a, uh, one of the buildings of St. Paul's Church. But we think that this was uh, 1922. I personally think it, it's a decade or so uh, earlier than that. But uh, you can see uh, uh, in the foreground all the kids and the clergy, and it's just a, uh, there's some sort of ceremony perhaps. Uh, so this is at the corner uh, and so our structure is the second one, the one in the background, and and if blown up, it, you could see uh, in grainy detail the siding on the house, uh, the w din uh, detail around the windows, some porch details, and it's it's actually been pretty revealing for us in moving forward. Uh, and we're going to you know lean heavily on it, but uh, this is where our house originally sat, uh, and the original owners were uh, a lovely couple named the Taylors. And the Taylors are very instrumental uh, in that uh, in development of St. Paul's and that they donated uh, the land where the, the building in the foreground sits so that St. Paul's could build that building. Uh, and then as St. Paul's and their congregation grew, they outgrew this building and the Taylors' very own home, ironically, was in the way of progress or expansion of the church, and so it was deemed uh, way back when, we don't have an exact date, but sometime in the 30s or 40s, uh, the Taylor House was picked up and moved, and moved to 202 North Swinton Avenue, also a corner, so uh, from a corner to a corner, uh, and uh, that's where it sits today. It's a, it's a block away from this building right here, so it has a very high visibility corner on uh, on the crossroads of North Swinton and what is that Second Street Second Street so um, and it was put down with the same orientation that it had when it sat in its original site so we're very happy about that uh, uh, maybe when we have a grand reopening for our building we'll get all these kids <laughs> from space of mind and we'll sit out in front and have a big party. But that's a great photo that we thought we'd start out with. So we can go to the next one, maybe the next one, next one. So, uh, so we developed uh, some floor plans. We documented the house, uh, went over it inch by inch, developed some uh, existing floor plans. You can maybe go one more, Ronnie. <clears throat> uh, 
That's the second floor. Uh, the tiny, tiny little footprints. These are very modest uh, uh, spaces. So it's, it's not like it's a gigantic building at all. The square footages are on the drawings. Did go one more? Run out of battery juice? Yeah? yeah. You gotta bounce, bounce it off the glass. There you go. So, uh, so that morphed into our, uh, our proposed floor plan. So we were, it's, and by the way, uh, 10, 15, 20 years ago, the building was converted uh, by use. It was converted to a commercial property. So uh, it's, it was set up with a ramp, a handicapped spot, exterior lighting, exit lights on the interior, everything that a commercial building needs to have. So it's as if you know, the public can, can uh, visit it. And, and so we bought a historic building that's a, that's a commercial property, parking off the alley, a uh, couple of little spots off the front, uh, and, and uh, we are not changing the footprint one iota. We're, we're not expanding the building uh, by a square foot, nor are we reducing it by a square foot. Our, our job is to, uh, that's the second floor, got a fireplace dead center in the, in the middle of the floor plan, which is kind of the heart of the, of the uh, floor plan, uh, which is common back then. Uh, but let's get into the next one. That's it, the roof plan. So there's our, there's the existing front elevation as it sits today. Um, quite different from that archival photograph. Um, the front porch was, a, was originally a wraparound front porch, but somehow over the years, somehow, some way, the left-hand side of it uh, was in, was uh, filled in to capture, you know, to hundreds extra square feet. So uh, we 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 we're tasked for the moment to restore it as it sits today. We're not going to open that porch back up. Uh, but um, and I will say this: in the late '80s, there was a fire uh, uh, on the second level. Uh, which would be up near that uh, the right-hand window in, in the upper part of the slide. And so uh, we, we fully expect to find some damage to the wood uh, roof and to a couple of the exterior wood walls uh, because uh, the center element in that second level at one point in time was a window, there, uh, which, which would have made it a triple window up at the upper level. And so we're going to bring back that triple window, and we're going to repair all the damage uh, that, uh, that we know for sure occurred during the fire. Because immediately after the fire, the entire outside of the house which was, uh, was clad in, a, uh, in a, uh, a shingle on the exterior of the house, which covered up all the beautiful detail of the wood, the siding, the trim, and everything. So as soon as we uh, get the legal okie doke in a month or so, we're gonna strip the outside of this house from that non-original shingle, and we're gonna expose uh, the true exterior skin of this house, and whatever it is that we find, we're gonna document, report back to staff, and we're gonna, we're gonna run with that. Uh, so uh, the slides that we're gonna go through now, and we're gonna do this quickly, uh, in each case, the existing elevation is above, and the proposed elevation is below. Um, now, one of the conditions of approval that staff, uh, that we absolutely agree with, it, we were trying to introduce a little round nautical window, which you can see in the lower uh, right of the, of the lower elevation. Uh, staff would rather that window be a square window. We completely agree. There are four of them on the house that we were trying to sneak in here and there to be a little playful. Uh, we have thought otherwise. We're gonna go all square as staff has recommended. And then we're gonna, uh, as I stated earlier, we're gonna put a triple window in that upper gable. And uh, we're gonna put a brand new uh, Western red cedar shake roof on the house. We're gonna make the, the house waterproof uh, for the first time in 100 years. And uh, we're gonna, Put brand new windows and doors in everywhere, 
uh, matching the existing uh, mutton pattern that we that we see in archival photographs, not in what exists today. And so that uh, that bottom image is exactly what we hope we end up with. Um, it, it, the house has the, it, I've never seen it, uh, certainly not in Delray, but a Tudoresque style arched <laughs> element uh, in, the, in the gables, in, in the upper gables. Um, that is original. So, uh, but I try to, in most of my gabled houses, I try to do a simulated vent element behind that, uh, which I depict here. But should we strip the siding, the, 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 the improper siding off the outside of the house and find something uh, uh, less ornate there, we're going we're gonna to always defer to what it is that we discover. So we're going to have this little period of discovery that's going to influence uh, little minor situations like that. So uh, maybe jump to the next slide, Ron. So here is our south elevation. This is uh, very much an exposed elevation that faces uh, Second Street. So, so you know anybody that comes to City Hall from the north is very likely to see this elevation. We're going to clean this thing up. Uh, so next slide, if you will. So again, upper uh, drawing is existing, bottom drawing is uh, proposed. So uh, the, the site consists of not only the main house, which is that on the right, but the, it has a tiny little subordinate house in the back, uh, which was uh, essentially a garage originally, uh, the date of which is unknown. Uh, but we are, because it's subordinate, because it's in the rear, because it's much shorter and smaller and tinier and less important, uh, we have the uh, artistic license to modify it a little, with a little bit more freedom than we do with the main house. So we're taking the opportunity to convert uh, a big, gigantic, flat roof in the original part of that subordinate structure, which you see in the upper left, and we're going to make it uh, shaped, gabled, and therefore, uh, you know, uh, uh, much more uh, harmonious, if you will, with that of the main house. We're not, uh, we're not going to replicate it, but we're going to make it a little bit more harmonious uh, and interesting. And the, the, the rear structure is basically nothing more than a conferencing center. So that will be the standalone conference building. It'll have its own standalone bathroom and maybe, uh, two, uh, opportunities for clerical people. So it's a very tiny little structure, but, uh, we're gonna, and we've dropped all the landscaping, uh, layers off of this thing. We're going to have an absolutely stunning landscape plan. Uh, that makes it much more presentable to the street, to the public. Next slide. No? Out of juice? We're running out of juice on the old remote. Yeah, there we go. So this is the north elevation. Uh, and, so the, and this is a photo of the combo corner, the, the north and the west elevation. Got a real funky uh eyebrow element over one of the corners and we're gonna clean that up and again put new windows and doors in everywhere and um you can see one of the round windows there in the uh, elevation on the bottom that'll be converted into a square and you know more of the same it's it's a bit of a symmetrical and this is a, a, a good of a, a western elevation as we can get. It's got a layer of landscaping in front of it. So as you can imagine, over the past 100 years, there's wires, conduit, electrical elements, gas lines, all kinds of stuff have been tacked to the outside of this thing. We're going underground with everything. We're, we're going to end up with nothing attached to the outside of it. We're going to make it extremely clean. 
we're going we're gonna to harken back to the original color scheme that we discover, uh, which was pretty mundane, probably a basic white uh, with the Tudor elements maybe being some sort of a, a brownish element that matches uh, uh, the roof. Uh, and so, uh, again, when we discover, uh, we, should, we should discover some color concepts uh, underneath the skin after we strip all that off. So, and this is a, these are a couple of goofy shots of the exterior uh, subordinate building in the back just to show you how mundane it is. It currently has a uh, hardy plank on it, so we're, we're not really hardy plank fans. We're uh, more interested in uh, uh, siding it with a with an S shape or a Dutch colonial style siding that might match that of the house. Uh, and if we do that, we would do that out of real wood. We originally wanted to do it out of a man-made product, but uh, we discovered it had a little bit of plastic in it. Out of the, uh, so we dropped that. And so, uh, you know, we'd like the opportunity to clad it in the exact siding of the house. And, uh, you know, to make the two tie in together a lot more than they do today, a lot more than they ever have. And I'm not sure what that is. A little elevation, that's a, a little elevation of the back building as seen from the courtyard. There's a beautiful courtyard in between the two buildings. And then last but not least, uh, a window and door schedule, which of course we're always supposed to have. I think there's one photo, this is the siding. This is uh, what I call a German shiplap siding. It's got a, a cove detail to it. It's not your standard uh, off-the-shelf siding. And Hardy Plank, to the best of my knowledge, doesn't make this profile. So even if uh, Hardy Plank made it, we still probably wouldn't use Hardy Plank. But uh, our goal is to uh, re-expose this stuff on the exterior of the, uh, the rear cottage as well. So uh, having said that, Ron, you want to say anything? Nope. <laughs> uh, we thank you very much. Uh, again, every condition of approval that staff has made, uh, we're in complete agreement with, and uh, we're all here available for questions should you have them from us. Thank you. For the record, I'm Michelle Hewitt, planner, um, and this is agenda item 8A for 202 North Swinton Avenue, um, a COA um, for this property. Um, the requests for this property are exterior modifications to exterior structures, including window and door replacements slash installations, roof pitch change to the detached structure in the rear, roof material change, and repainting of the structure. So here we have an aerial of the property, which is outlined in red. To the east is North Swinton Avenue, and to the south is Northwest 2nd Street. Um, in the rear of the property, it abuts an alley, and to the north of the property, it abuts a property. Um, I'm just going to go through some brief history. Um, this property is within the OSHAD um, historic, or Old School Square Historic Art, um, Arts District. Um, and the property contains two structures, a two-story frame vernacular style residence constructed in 1922 and a detached one-story um, storage structure also constructed in 1922, which is located in the southwest corner of the property. Um, both are classified as contributing to the locally and nationally designated um, listed old school square historic district. Um, the home is believed to have been originally located on the St. Paul's Church property and was moved to the subject property in order to allow for the construction of a new parish house for the church. Um, in its original location, the home was likely owned by Ms. Rebecca Taylor prior to 1935. Um, this information was given to us by Mr. George Long um, from Sapling to Sturdy Oak, a book from the St. Paul's Church. Um, Oh wait, along with an oral history from Mr. George Long, um, who resides in the Old School Square Historic District. So here we have an elevation of the front of the property. Um, this is um, 
shows that the structure originally had a wraparound front porch, which you can see on the left there, um, that was partially enclosed, which is visible now, um, along with the cross gabled roof um, on the structure. Um, here is the corner or southeast elevation. Um, these are both sides face um, the streets um, on the right or the front is along North Swinton and on the left or this uh, south side is again Northwest 2nd Street. So here we have another corner of the southeast. Um, you can see more of the existing conditions on the south on this elevation as well as the porch. Um, here we have the a full elevation of the side or south elevation. Again, you can see um, those conditions there. Um, here we have the rear or west side of the property. Uh, this abuts the alley, um, or this faces the alley. Um, again, you can see existing conditions and features. Um, this is the corner or northwest elevation. Um, this side abuts another property. Um, and here you can see some of the existing eyebrows on the structure. Um, this is a full-on elevation of the side or north elevation. Again, this abuts um, a property. Um, and then here we have the corner or northeast elevation, um, where you can see the side and the front of the structure. So here is the detached structure from the east elevation. Uh, this faces the back of the uh, main structure. And then we have the uh, rear or west elevation of the detached structure. Here you can see um, glass block windows that are currently existing in there. That is currently existing. Um, here's the detached structure from the side or north elevation where you can see the location of the existing door. Here we have the uh, detached structure. Um, this is along Northwest 2nd Street. Uh, again, you can see existing conditions including the glass block and some windows. Uh, here we have from the uh, another angle of the south elevation of the detached structure. Okay, so this is the existing survey with the existing structures highlighted in blue, with the main residence in the middle and at the uh, southwest corner is the detached structure. Here we have the existing first floor plan. All of the existing windows and doors are highlighted in blue. Here we have the proposed first floor plan, um, new windows um, and enclosures of doors and windows are highlighted and outlined in red. And then here's the proposed second floor plan um, with against the existing second floor plan. Um, on the left is existing and on the right is the proposed, again red highlighting new windows. And then so here we have the um, existing east or front elevation at the top and at the bottom is the proposed front or east elevation. Um, the existing items are highlighted in blue and the proposed are in red. Um, so we have included notes um, on the elevations as the applicant has proposed modifications to the previous request. Um, site, plan site plan technical items have been included to address these changes. Um, modifications on both structures include replacement of the shingle roofing for cedar shake, installation of clear impact windows, um, and replacement of plastic shutters with aluminum. On the main residence, previously a louver fill-in was proposed where the open gable will now remain. Um, and a new center window, window is now proposed where one was originally located, which you can see um, highlighted there at the bottom image. Um, on the detached structure, a new roof pitch is proposed, which is, um, can be considered appropriate um, due to the already existing pitched roofs on the site. Uh, for siding, boral was previously proposed on the detached structure, but is now proposed to be wood. On the main residence, the proposal includes the removal of the existing siding to expose the original wood siding underneath. However, however the proposal does not indicate a plan for replacement of existing siding uh, should it not be in good condition. There is concern that the original siding may not exist or be in good condition given the fire that occurred in the 1980s. And then finally, the previously requested porthole windows are now proposed to be square windows throughout both structures, which you can also see highlighted here um, and pointed at. So here is um, the location at the top circle shows where the new uh, center window is to be installed that was originally there. Um, and at the bottom is the location of pro the uh, proposed square window where a um, 
support hole was previously requested. And at the top, you can see the currently existing open uh, gable details that are to remain. Um, here we have an east elevation um, circling the proposed location of the square window. So here is the uh, side or north elevation. Again, existing is on top and proposed is at the bottom. Um, you can see um, this side abuts the uh, a property. Um, a new eyebrow is proposed where French doors previously were on the main residence or main structure. On the detached structure, a new clerestory window is proposed, which there are concerns about addressed later in the PowerPoint. Here's the north elevation here. Circled is the location of one of those proposed square windows. Here is the proposed rear elevation or west. Again, existing is in blue on the left and then proposed on the right with red highlighting um, proposed modifications. Um, a new gable end is proposed on this, um, I'm sorry. Um, yes, so here you can see new gable detail is proposed on this side where there currently is not one existing um, to match the others on the structure. Um, and then again, it's highlighting the um, louver filling that's no longer proposed. It's just going to be open like the other ones. Okay, here we have the detached structure existing on the left and proposed is on the right. Um, this is the uh, proposed roof pitch change. Um, on this structure, along with the removal of the glass block for two French doors. And the again, the borrow siding that was previously proposed is now proposed to be wood on this structure. Here we have the detached structure here where you can see the glass block that is proposed to be um, replaced with French doors. Here we have the side or south elevation. This is along a street. Um, here, again, highlighting the uh, previously proposed portholes that are now going to be square, um, along with the um, uh, changing or altering of the uh, currently existing door on the detached structure and the addition of a new window on the uh, main structure at, on the first floor. So here is the corner or northeast elevation, um, highlighting where the proposed square window is to be. Okay, well here we have building material and colors, colors form, which um, highlights the proposed building and materials and colors. Um, here we have an excerpt um, from the staff reports talking about the clerestory windows. On the north, um, there is concern as the style of window is not typically seen on frame vernacular structures, rather it is typical of a modern architectural style. Um, additionally, the existing structure does not include clerestory windows. Um, then here we have Stippet, or the Secretary of the Interior Standards for Rehabilitation for the board. Um, and we have the visual compatibility standards that staff used to analyze um, the um, project. And then we have the uh, LDR findings. And that concludes my presentation. Do we have any public comment? George Law, 46 North Swinton Avenue. I could go on and on, but there's just one word for this, and that's great. What else can I say? It's going to really <laughs> be outstanding. Uh, Redoing that front building and the back building is going to uh, have more of a historic ambience than that little square looking box out there now. But let me not waste this time. More history. There was a couple there named Alice Dedrick and P.D. Dedrick. P.D. was an accountant in Delray. That was before the 1980. This would be the 70s, I, I think, maybe. And he was the accountant at George Murakami. So he must have done pretty good because George Murakami was able to donate that great park. Thank and you. Any rebuttal or cross-examination from staff? None from staff. Any from the applicant? All right, we are in board discussion. I'll kick it off. I think you should. All right. <laughs> so, um, no, I, I, I like the project. I was on the board the last time this came, well, I don't know, 2011. Like that uh, when it was converted to um, I think 
it was a law office at the time. Um, it's unfortunate. It looks like the property really wasn't kept up since then. Uh, but I do like, I've always loved this property, the symmetry of it, um, the fact that it really hasn't been touched in so long. Um, glad they're going back to wood siding. Um, you know, getting rid of the glass block and that small uh, accessory building in the back. I have no problems with the. Is it not on? <laughs> oh, sorry. Right, anyway, I'm not going to repeat everything, but uh, um, you know, getting rid of the glass block in the back window. Um, you know, the changes that are proposed to be made to this project are, I think, reasonable and respectful of the original. Um, structure and by doing this I hope that this will secure uh, this building for the foreseeable future so if it's fixed up somebody's putting some resources into it it's going to be a, a viable adaptive reuse to the historic district nobody's going to want to come along and, and take it down or, or modify it even more dramatically um, I had a question for staff on the uh, where you have the reds and the blues um, the roof material is now asphalt mm -hmm. and did I hear correctly it was going back to cedar shake um yes they're doing cedar shake oh, okay that's interesting and great um, theoretically though I guess technically speaking the whole building should be red because it is changing correct oh. Um, or you kept it blue because it's going back to the original siding? Oh, I mean, just to show like what's currently not there, existing what's existing right now, okay. as, as opposed to what's proposed right. today. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> the siding is going to be removed. Right. Mm -hmm. okay. And the roof is going to be replaced. Okay. That's all I have. Uh, I'm in support of it, by the way. <laughs> I just, um, so one of the questions that I had was on the north elevation, and um, it looks like there's a big deck out there in one of the photographs originally, Oh. Um, and there's French doors. Yeah. There. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to tell in the new drawings, does it maintain uh, an outdoor deck porch? Uh, it's hard to see if that, I don't think it ties in with the front porch. Yes. Could I get a question, could I get that answered by the architect? Yes, thank you, Rhonda. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> that's the ADA access into the, into the structure from the alley parking area. Okay. So uh, we're going to retain that. Uh, we're, we're changing the, the, the double door configuration to a single door, and we're adding a cute little eyebrow over it to make it uh, tie in more to the corner element. We're, we're de-emphasizing it a little bit, uh, but the deck will remain. Uh, okay. The, the deck has plastic railing on it. We're not, you know, we're gonna not bring plastic railing back. I can promise you that. Well, it doesn't ha show a railing on your drawings. And if I did, so that's why would, I thought maybe it was going to go away. You know, just looking at two days, it, it obscures the building, and you know. Okay, and so will it have to be ramped? Is that you say? Yeah, the ramp. The ramp will remain. So it's a, a ramp. Okay. The ramp. The ramp will remain, but we're we're providing the handicapped restroom to the rear building, uh, which uh, you know we're shifting the dynamic a little bit, but. Um, so that most of the handicap conferencing or whatever you're doing may occur back we're gonna there. Make, we're gonna make everything accessible. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm in favor of the project. I love the shake roof. Um, I love that the porch is opening up. It doesn't really bother me on the accessory building that there's a clear story door. I uh, know that they're doing that so they can get the height and yet maintain a, a typical standard uh, door uh, that kind of matches in with the other doors so that would be my uh, thought on that um, I want to talk a little bit about the porch 
I'm, I'm not quite sure why you're leaving that sort of the south side porch covered and you really, it's almost like two different buildings because you have the one where it's open with the railing and the other uh, with some sort of windows. Why wouldn't you, and I think Roger, your words were, porch is closed for the moment, which would imply that perhaps the porch might be open at a later date, and if so, why not open it now? and make it symmetrical? Um, well, uh, we're not ruling it out, Jim, uh, but we're coming before you as, as if we're retaining the original footprint that uh, we inherited. So it's, it's a minor amount of square footage, but for a tenant, you know, we all know, we're, we're, you know every square foot counts for a tenant. It's a very modest, tiny little footprint. We, we expect a full, a, a single tenant in the main house. And, um, you know, it's uh, architecturally, it would be amazing to convert it back to the open porch. But, but uh, uh, you know, the, the, the use of that square footage is, uh, it's a little bit more of an important factor to the bottom line. That's always one of those hard decisions, right? You know, trading off the space for the architecture. But it just seems to me that um, I never it, would have enclosed it, it, it originally. I would have found a different way to add an appendage onto the house somehow to make up for that square footage. But so we, we didn't create it. It is the front of the house or it the is, building. No, no doubt about it. And that's what everybody's going to see. Is there some other trade-off, perhaps? We're, op we're open. We're open-minded. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm sure we may want to discuss it amongst ourselves. Oh. But that that uh, really leaped out at me. Um, and the other the other question is. Uh, as we all know, when these walls are open, we tend to find things that we don't expect. So what if you take that siding down and the, w the wood underneath that you're kind of depending on to go back to, what if that is burned or full termites or anything? What is your plan B? So we filed for an, uh, an interior demo permit. We, we have it. Do we have it, Ron? We, we have it. We, we have it. We, we've demoed enough to know 100%. We're 100% sure the original siding is in spectacular condition. 99% of it is there. Uh, the, 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 the fire caused more damage to the roof than to the walls. So there, there will certainly be some damage that we didn't anticipate. Uh, on the walls, and we'll repair that with real wood to match the profile of the, of the real siding. We'll, we'll seamlessly make that happen. But uh, the, the, so we've, we know the, how the house is put together structurally. Uh, we, we've studied the floor system, the, uh, the roof system, everything. We're going to vault, the, the thing used to have flat ceilings on the second floor. We're vaulting all the uh, ceilings of the second floor, capturing that space and making it much more interesting to, to, for a tenant. Uh, but we're, we're really excited about what we've discovered in our, in our uh, demo, our light interior demo. Uh, we, we, we can't wait to strip the skin off the outside and expose this thing. Um. And, and my last question is if your, your railing on the ramps is not plastic, what would it be? Are you think Real you don't know? wood or, or, or aluminum mm -hmm. or whatever staff would, whatever you guys would approve. Okay. Um, can I make a quick comment to what Roger said previously about the wood? Um, there, just, there is a site plan technical item regarding the wood, um, citing the removal of it, um, just to, at the end of the staff report. Okay. Just a small note. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Roger. I guess I'll jump in. Um, 
So, first of all, I would like to you know comment the on the thoroughness of the drawings. I think it's uh, very nicely handled. Um, the details. To your point, uh, what happens? And, and I'm glad you went in and did demo um, interior demo. The third window on th that is being proposed is that. Is there a structural support back there? Can we do that? Roger. In other words, what I, what I don't want to do is um, agree to something that can't be done structurally. So when we did the interior demo of the second level, we discovered all the window stops and trim uh, of that centerpiece. We know for a fact that there was a, uh, a window there. And we suspect, it's conjecture, but we suspect that the fire department might have gone in that center window when they were fighting the fire. Just speculation. So uh, staff has agreed with us. Uh, there's a triple window. You can see a triple window. It already exists on the house on the right side of uh, the table to the right. So we know a triple window is uh, certainly not out of the question. And uh, so uh, we're going to put that guy in, back in. There's Great. no structural element there. Great, thank you. And then I noticed in the window details, you call out an ES window product. It's not necessarily a really historic. Possible manufacturer. What's that? It's a possible manufacturer. Possible manufacturer, okay. Yeah, it's kind of like, uh, you know. Right. Crack home kind of window. But you know, I, I would like to see a, a, a little bit more historic type window specified. We all would. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Um, other than that, I, I, I love the project. I love the, uh, what you're doing, restoring the arch on the other, on the other facade. Um, I'm, I'm, I like it. Actually, not restoring, adding it. Adding it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. So, by the way, welcome to the board. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Anything? You guys have asked all the questions I had, and I like it. I like it a lot. Agreed. Yeah, I would just say to Jim's comment on the, I would love to see that other side opened up. Um, I'm guessing by the windows that are on there now, it was probably closed in in the 60s or 70s when they had the whole crank windows. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't hold the applicant to hold up this approval for them to open it up, just because that could be considered a, a financial burden. You know, since you would lose square feet on the inside, that's the only reason. I'd love to see it, but if they're not willing to do it at this point, I'm not going to hold them to it. Could we look at the elevation again? I, I understand the practicality you're speaking of, John. I just would hope there would be some sort of trade-off where, where you could get the square footage, um, but uh, make make the somewhere else, right? Make the south side look like the north side. Or, 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 or they close in the north side <laughs> to make it even. So. That is a creative solution. I wouldn't support You're that. You're not helping. <laughs> no, I, there's always a uh, downside, right? So. Could I ask a question? Are those roller windows in the in that porch? Uh, they're projected, they're projected on it. Like, like John said, projected on it. I'm sorry? 60s or 70s, usually. Yeah. Now, what, what are you putting in? We're putting in a uh, single hung. It doesn't mm. show that on your drawing. Yeah. Uh, not what she just showed us. Oh, you want me to go to the elevation? Yeah, on the technical drawings. Yeah, right there. Yeah. Well, if you can see it, you're look. You're doing better than I am. <laughs> what do you mean? I, I can see it on the upper windows. I can see the um, that they're a single or double hung. Yeah. But not on the on the uh, porch. Yeah. They're 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 uh, the series as it turns the corner. They're all you know three foot wide guys, and so we we. We're making them operable, single home. Okay. Oh, Thank you. I never put in a projected awning. Is there any chance that since you're raising the roof 
on the subsidiary building, that that could provide the square footage you would lose if you opened the porch? Not in my world. Well, I know that's a pretty creative world, but. Well, I mean, we're, you know, we're hard to lease volume. Well, mm -hmm. You know, you can, but it's hard to lease volume. Height. It's I, I didn't mean by lease the, the volume. I was thinking of a second floor. So, second now. Uh, well, we have a budget also, you know. <laughs> mm. Okay. I, I don't disagree with you, Jim, but, it, but it's, it's, a, it's a tough one. I, I, it was probably the third thing I said to him when we met, you know. The first thing was, thanks for the beer. <laughs> Second thing was, thanks for hiring me, and let's open up that porch. So I'm working on him. I know that you asked the applicant a question about the um, accessory building, Mr. Chard, and possibly adding a floor to that, but that would require a whole new review and ensuring that there's compliance with the regulations and guidelines. Just, I, I don't want to design from the dais. No, we never want to do that. I guess it's time to make a motion. I make a motion to approve the certificate of appropriateness for the property located at 202 North Swinton Avenue, Old School Square Historic District, by finding that the request and approval thereof is consistent with a comprehensive plan and meets the criteria set forth in the land development regulations. I'll second. Rhonda. John Miller? Yes. Kristen Finn? Yes. Rhonda Saxon? Yes. Ivan Heredia? Yes. Jim Chard? Yes. Cody Willis Absent? Elise Lindstrom? Yes. All right. Motion passes. Thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, staff, if you would please read in item 8B for the record. Yes. For the record again, I'm Michelle Hewitt, and I'd like to read agenda item 8B. 209 Northeast Fifth Street, Del Ida Park Historic District, COA 2023-001 into the record. And Jim, would you start us off with ex parte, please? None. 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 Very good. We are ready for um, your presentation whenever you are. Thank you very much. Um, Well, good evening. My name is Richard Bromer. I'm here representing MJC Properties, uh, and we're seeking a certificate of appropriateness for this property. Uh, it's located on 219 Northeast 5th Street. It's currently an empty property, um, empty lot, uh, and we're designing a two-story Mason River Nacular House um, uh, for this property. Um, uh, let me see if I can pass this. That is basically shows the location of the house. The owners also, MJC Properties, they're currently working on the corner lot, renovating that house, and they have built several of the houses on that same street. So they have, they're very familiar and, you know, with the styles and what the board approves and what Derby Beach is looking for for this area. Um, here we have a side plan showing how the house is located. Um, this was re-platted. Basically, we added another five feet to get a little bit more width on the property and be able to lay out the house this way. Um, pool in the back, uh, garage, the front porch, and the entry of the house. Uh, here we can see the look 
um, relation with the houses next to it, the east house and uh, the west house, that is the one that they're currently renovating. They actually also built the house on the east. Um, here we can see that, um, and just to talk a little bit about the site plan, basically as far as the zoning requirements we're meeting, the building is meeting all the zoning requirements and um, area requirements. Uh, we also are complying with all the BHP as far as the you know ratio between you know the site and the first and second floor elevation and the diagonal setback. And this graphic also represents that we're meeting all the site facade setbacks required for the historic district. Here we have a floor plan showing front porch, the two-car garage, open concept uh, living room, uh, master bedroom with the closets and a nice backyard with a loggia and the pool. Second floor, um, nice loft with a balcony facing the back. Uh, we see the, the roof on the front, so because we had to step back the, uh, you know, the second floor to meet the BHP and also to reduce the, the massing of the house on the front. This is basically just to graphically show where you know the first floor roof area and where the second floor starts. Here we have the, the elevations, you know, depicting all the different elements, the board and button on the second floor, um, stucco finish, smooth stucco on the first floor, um, all the sidings and details of the windows, and um, you know, mostly single hang windows with all the muttons, um, et cetera, maintaining the character of the Mason River Knuckler. Side elevations, and here we can see how we're complying and why we push that second floor back to comply with the BHP requirement. Uh, here we have a few renderings from for the front street, what we're gonna see from the street basically on this house. Uh, here we have, you know, these other two houses were also built by MJC, RTG Construction. So we can see a comparison of all those three houses, kind of like a street view. Of course, you know, the reality is a little bit different. It's not that you know, the grass is not as beautiful as this one. The landscaper here was really good. <laughs> uh, here we have a couple of, you know, other houses in the area. This, the one on the top that, because one of the sub report was about the massing of the house. Um, the top picture, top left picture, shows a house that is actually right in front of us and has a two-story facade um, right in the corner. We also, had a comment regarding the garage doors and you know right on the other side of the street we have this other house that also has a two car garage so we are trying to minimize the fact that it's a two car garage door by you know adding panelings and windows to make it look like a you know a much simpler or much more elaborate than like a two car garage basically Um, here's another sample that is also like half a one block away from us. And uh, that's it. And thank you very much. That's basically in a nutshell what we're trying to do here. Any questions? Thank you. you? I think we have to go to staff first Perfect. and then we'll circle back with questions if we have any. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. For the record, I'm Katharina Palavoda, um, Historic Preservation Planner. Um, and this is, you'll see um, that the address is 209 Northeast 5th Street. Um, the originally, um, when this, when the first agenda for, uh, for February went through, um, I believe that the address um, wasn't given for the property. So it was lot five Northeast 5th Street. Um, so our, our presentation was re-edited just to include the, um, the new address. Okay. Um, so this is within um, the Del Ida Park Historic District. Um, a little bit of background. Um, so this was originally joined. Um, there was lots three, four, and five here. Um, you'll see here this is a historic um, 19, let me go 
Oh, here we go. Um, 1947 Streamline Modern Building. Um, so this was originally part of uh, the property of, um, of this structure here. And okay, let's see, here's an aerial. Um, so it's a vacant lot here. Um, a couple of things um, within the last year or so have happened with this property. Um, there was a rele release of unity of title, plat exemptions, all just so you know the uh, lots could be separated. Um, you'll see here the original driveway for um, the site at 503 um, Northeast 2nd. That's good. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Northeast 2nd um, Street was Northeast 2nd Avenue. Um, the original driveway was here, so they had to remove the driveway in order to be able to split the lots to not create any existing nonconformities. So um, here we have an image of what the driveway looks like, um, a part of the, um, the site um, separate from um, the vacant lot. So the extra five foot was given um, from lots three and four to lot five in order um, for this property. So um, this is the way the site exists today. And then here's just some adjacent properties. So these are the two new constructions um, to the east of the vacant lot um, that we're looking at today. Once again, this is um, to the west. Um, this is the um, historic Sheelan Modern structure. Just some more images. They had um, new landscaping put in, so we came back and took some more pictures. Okay, and then here you can see this is a subject property. Um, Okay, um, some other images. This is also a new construction. This is right across the street. Okay, and this is a survey um, where you can see where the, um, the lot split and the extra five foot was given to lot five here. Okay, this is existing site plan or the proposed site plan. Um, here you can see the proposed two story structure garage um, the little purple areas here show um, the open air parts of the um, the proposed structure as well um, as the pool in the rear okay and here we see this is a five I think this is part of the condition of approval um, I'm not sure what this is right here but um, the requirements require the deck to be within five um, the five foot setback so I believe we have this as a um, as a condition of approval here's just some setbacks um, just in case if there's any questions about it um, in discussion later um, this is a proposed first floor plan proposed second floor plan okay this is the proposed um, front south elevation Proposed in the rear, this is the north elevation. And this is the proposed side to the east. And then uh, the proposed side to the west. Um, this is a screenshot of the, um, the window and door schedules for um, the property. Here you can see that um, to comply with historic, they do have clear glass. Um, and then also to be non-reflective to match the historic um, uh, visual compatibility with the street. So we just noted that. Um, some renderings that Mr. Brimmer also showed. And then this is the proposed materials. So um, these are snippets from our staff report. Um, we did have, uh, staff did have a couple issues regarding visual compatibility. Um, a few things with the garage, um, one that we see here, um, normally with two car garages within historic districts, um, they're usually um, designed as separate. Um, our issue, there was a, one issue, I believe that they're using the Aztec, which is a synthetic material. We don't normally see those within historic districts. Um, but as well as the, um, the, the doors should be, it's recommended that the, the doors actually be two separate um, instead of like one large um, garage door. Okay. Um, also in addition, um, when we look at garages facing the street, um, historically um, within the area there are three. Um, but more importantly, uh, when we, I have a few pictures to show after this, it shows um, 
most of them are one car garages. We do have some example of two car garages within the district. So it does match visual compatibility in that way. However, you can see um, compared to um, the proposal, um, these are these are ones these are one car garages, but you can see they're a little bit more recessed from the front wall plane. Um, historically, with the with the historic houses, you know. Some maybe didn't have garages because maybe cars weren't available, but when cars, when garages were created, they weren't like the prominent features of the house. Um, so we can see um, here, these are new construction, but to fit with the historic streetscape, you can see that they're recessed. Um, so these are the properties again to the east of um, the subject property. This is the floor plan um, of the proposal. So here you can kind of see the front wall plane. This is a front wall plane here, open air front porch, and um, as you can see, the garage is a little more forward of um, the front wall of the actual um, um, yeah, um, AC structure. So here's another rendering where you can kind of see the difference here. And this is another example, um, also on Northeast Fifth Street, um, also one car garage, but you can also see that it's also recessed back. Here's also another example. And then this one, which is the property um, directly across the street, we can see the garage is placed in the rear of the, um, of the residence. So this is an example of a two-car um, garage. It's also um, new construction. However, you can see that they also have the two, um, the two doors. Here's another image of it. You can kind of see how it's recessed back. And then there's a little pergola here. Um, to kind of give it a nice decorative effect. Um, also, here's another new construction. We can also see um, they also have two doors, and I believe it's also recessed back, um, but you can't really see it behind this the landscaping. But um, they also use the two door instead of one large door. Oh, this is a historic structure. Um, this is on Northeast 7th, so it's a, a couple blocks over. Also, you can see um, there's two doors as well. Um, and the, the garage is also recessed to the back. Um, this is also another historic home. Um, you can see the garage also two door, um, but it, it's to the rear of the, um, the main structure. This is also another example, and I believe the garage is um, to the rear of the property. Okay, another um, concern we had regarding visual compatibility um, was just massing just within the streetscape. Um, here we can see um, the streamlined modern structure, um, the proposed, proposed structure here, and then the, the two to the east that were also new construction. Um, the, the streetscape is a one to two story uh, with new construction and historic, um, but you can see here the the massing on this on this um, particular structure compared to these two is a little bit um, larger, so it doesn't really match with the streetscape. Here, this is an, um, an aerial image, and from what you can see from the historic structures that are still existing on the street, um, the visual compatibility of the historic streetscape they, it was typically one story. With new construction, you know, now the historic district has one to two stories. This is another image too, where you can see some of the one stories for the historic structures and then the new constructions that are um, two story. Okay, once again, these are the Secretary of Interior Standards. Um, these are what we look at to determine whether or not, you know, the proposal is appropriate to not only the historic streetscape, but as well as the um, new construction or um, any um, modifications to historic structures. And then this is the visual compatibility. Um, specifically, the, um, the concerns we had, let me see if I can find it. Materials, materials um, relating to that Aztec material on the, on the garage door, um, but also, um, let's see, proportion of facade openings. Oh, sorry, okay, so E, read them of buildings on street. So that was our other concern. Okay, so these are the findings. And then uh, site plan technical items. I previously mentioned that the, um, 
the paper pool um, deck needed to be um, within a five foot setback, um, and that all building materials be, se be specified on the architectural elevation plan sheets. Okay, so that concludes my presentation. Any public comment? Good evening. My name is Ann Cannon. I live at 236 Dixie Boulevard. I've lived in Del Ida Park Historic District since 1990. Um, and I'm a little concerned about some of the items in the construction of this house. Um, and I would like uh, to say that the comparison made to the house across the street is not valid. That is more than one lot that that, that, that two-story house is on. And it's not really a house. It's actually a, um, a drug rehab center right now. Um, so that comparison is not valid when you're talking about this lot. This lot actually all of the papers to complete the cutout that was done has not reached my office so i'm unable to determine the the square footage of this lot most of the lots in our uh, districts are 60 by 120. most of our garages are at the back as such as mine um, the two-car garage to the front is it it creates this massing effect that's not Credible in that neighborhood and um, it needs it looks like they stuffed all this house in this small lot to get all the things that they wanted for whoever's gonna buy it and that's their prerogative but I think your job as a board is to talk about what's relevant um, to protect the integrity of our historic district. And for those of you who haven't lived here as long as I have, this historic district was the very first historic district created in 1988 in, this, in Delray Beach. And it was created to save this area. Um, it was given an RO uh, rating. We have uh, doctor's offices and residential. And I, I will say to you, it's only in the last 10 years that that historic district has really taken off and people value their properties and they are being sold and new um, people are re renovating them. Um, but this, this house, it concerns all of us in our um, Del Ida Park Hist uh, Historic District Association. It's really just out of context for our neighborhood. And, and I have to say that the house that you all did on the corner, we all prayed for somebody to save that house. So thank you, because it's beautiful. Um, there are some materials that are simulated stucco on the house instead of stucco itself, which I think is the comment about all the building materials need to be identified. Um, the setback from the west side of the property line is the paver for the pool, and it's three feet instead of five, which is required in Delida Park. Um, the, it, it's not, and all these things, well, everyone says, uh, this may, this doesn't create a precedent. Legally it doesn't, but the next developer that walks in will use this to make the house bigger they want to remodel and to change the variances that are required in our neighborhood. So it does mean something and your vote does mean something. So I'm not against putting a house there. I'm against the massing of the house and some other concerns that have been identified. And I would ask that your instructions would be to tell them to change it so it's, it's um, conducive to our neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other public comment? <coughs> Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Jeff Wooster. I'm 848 East Drive, Boynton Beach. Um, I appreciate your comments and I understand. Um, we've developed over the years 10, 10 or so properties between the Marina District and the Historic District, <clears throat> several on her street, and we're very proud of them. So um, the reason we this lot ended up being 55 feet, we deeded five feet over sorry, so we could can we pause for a second sure. you're the applicant correct i am okay so i'm sorry we have to um pause for public comment okay not applicant not okay. staff at this time okay um but we will be glad to hear you sure. as soon as we get into rebuttal 
Sorry, I was a little bit confused as to who was, <laughs> who was coming up. Do we have any public comment? Any other public comment? Okay, very good. Um, I'm sorry, so now a cross-examination from the staff or rebuttal from the staff? I don't have any rebuttal at this time. Okay. <laughs> now if we could have the applicant, please. <laughs> and if you could, please, I'm so sorry, but I need you to step up to this side because oh. we're going to be asking for okay. staff to, you know, we might have a little conversation going here. Okay. So Jeff Wooster, 848 East Drive, Point Beach. Um, I also, on RTG construction, we've developed several hundred houses in Delray Beach over the past 20 years, 10 or so in the historic district, and we're, as I said, we're very proud of them. Um, a couple on her road. Um, on this particular street, we've developed five properties, and we realize um, the massing does look a little bigger than the house next door, but that's why we deeded five feet over to this property, so we could get a two-car garage. Um, we can make it two single doors instead of one double door. Um, any other concerns you would have, um, it's not that big of a house. It's 3,000 square feet. So the setbacks are within the city code, so we're not violating that. OK. Um, anything back from staff? No rebuttal from staff. Very good. If it's all right with you, we're going to go into uh, okay. public, or I'm sorry, into board discussion thank you uh, quickly could I ask the staff why is none of this coming through as a variance um, they meet all the setbacks um, they did have a plat exemption um, but that was handled administratively but other than the um, the pool deck in the rear um, which usually you know if they were to put a pool in the back that is usually handled by permit um, but because they had it on the plans here, we just wanted to make sure that they met the five foot. So as long as they can meet that, no variance is required. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Let's start. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, do you mind just putting up the one of the pictures? Mm -hmm. um, so. I'm overwhelmed by the scale of it. Uh, even next to the newer homes, it's just out of proportion. There's no architectural detail involved in the architecture of this. It's, it, I, I know you're saying it's a, a certain style, but um, the garage doors, are way too forward. They're forward of the front door. They're forward of the front of the house. I don't see how that's ever acceptable in a in a uh, historic district. The division of the the garage doors is always uh, recommended and demanded, usually by our board. Um, I think that this is the smallest lot in this configuration on this street, and yet this is the largest house. He just said it's 3,000 square feet, but the floor area is 4,298 square feet. So I think it's just overwhelming the lot, and it's overwhelming the properties next to it. I think it needs to be scaled back, and you know, it's up to the applicant how they do that, but it, it doesn't meet our criteria. I mean, I kind of, I agree with Rhonda looking at it here, the massing, yes, it may meet the setbacks, but we're concerned with other things other than setback. There's visual compatibility standards. And to me, this, this does, um, does push the limits in that neighborhood and it expands the envelope. So yes, while this is just a little bit more then the next one's gonna be a little bit more and the next one's gonna be a little bit more. Um, the example that you used as far as the two-car garage across the street was probably not the best example because I remember I was on the board when that one went through and um, there's people that still give me dirty looks on that one when that one was approved. And that had to be a dozen years ago. 
Um, not that one. It was it was one on second. It's actually across the street, and I'm not necessarily opposed to a two car garage, but in a less prominent position on the street, and and you know you can do something design wise to separate the two to make it look a little bit less. But yeah, go back to that. that uh, the other one you had where it had the garage, the floor plan. Just. Uh, She's going to also show the one that you're referencing that's... Um, it's kind of a cockeyed house on the lot there. It's actually on a corner. Yeah. So well, it's an obtuse angle there on the corner. This, this is on a corner. Not that one. But yeah. That one. Yeah. But the other yeah. one's on a corner um, lot, and mm -hmm. so the garage is facing the side street, not 2nd Avenue. Yeah. So... This is on the opposite corner, right? This is on 2nd and... This is on the west Dixie. side... West side of Levi. second. Between. I still get grief over this one too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And then go I mean, I was on the board then too. <laughs> um, you know, overall by itself, out in the middle of, you know, uh, a void, the house it's forty feet wide. It's not. Um, to me, it's not overwhelming. Except when you put it on the smallest lot on this block, then it is overwhelming. So I think. Um, you know uh, where it sits and the the conditions of the lot itself and I understand the whole the house the lot was split that was another question when the lot was replatted as I looked on Papa and mm -hmm. at this point it's not replatted and did that have to come before the board because I believe replatting from one lot to two we ran into this a few years ago, now has to come before the board. So um, if I can remember, because these were all lots of record, um, we could do it administratively. And so what they had recorded all together was the plat exemption, um, the unity of title release, um, as well as the site plan. So I don't. I, this was, I think, in December that this all went through. So um, I don't know if it's, um, if it's been reflected on the website yet. But we do have the recorded documents. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's a vacant lot. The house can be designed any which way you want to. At this point, I think there are more appropriate ways to do it that are more sensitive to the neighborhood. That's all. I think you probably get the same square footage out of it mm -hmm. if it's just reconfigured a little bit. Yeah, I agree with those, those statements. Um, I guess, yeah, my biggest concern is the size of that lot and size of the house. Um, also, uh, I wrote down some things about the stucco. Um, I asked staff, like, uh, the materials that they were using, their like a faux stucco uh, or something. I, mean, I don't understand why they wouldn't use normal stucco. Yeah, so she's asking if it's simulated stucco. The, like the, the board and that. It oh, it is? Oh. Um, usually for new construction, um, they're allowed for that, but like if this was no. part of an addition, it's not the same thing. May I say something? Okay, go ahead. Oh. No, you're okay. <laughs> I think what you're asking is if the upper floor board and batten detail is stucco, simulated stucco siding. Is that what you're simulated. asking? Simulated, yeah, because I was looking, asking about the technical oh. items. It is a, okay. a simulated stucco. It's not a um, applied material like wood or hardy plank and in the past the board has gone both ways but mostly not approved simulated stucco simulated siding so it's just on the upper portion of the board and batten uh, um the that yes. detail up there yes and then you also have a banding around the bottom which um underneath the window which the window sits on that you would typically have at that detail that's a stucco detail as well, but the entire upper floor is a simulated stucco siding. They call it a board and batten detail, but it's oh, okay. not a um, applied material like a, a wood or a hardy board. Sorry. Thank you. No, I missed that. <laughs> I thought that was uh, Again, I don't think our job is to draw new plans for them um, or to, you know, to tell them, but... Um, obviously, you want to maximize a um, lot, that sort of thing, but in comparison to this street and also Delida, um, I guess I should expose, I live in Delida Historic District, so I'm very familiar with um, all the houses in our district. 
Um, so I do agree that this particular street, especially since there we do have comparison, typically we don't have new construction comparison mm -hmm. on the street. We have the other beautiful homes um, with the garages that are set back. Um, I understand a one car garage doesn't work for everybody, um, but the two car garage could be separated. Um, I agree with what Rhonda said about the architecture. Um, I'm not sure what's, what, I forgot what the notes said about the style of architecture. I think the, the color scheme on the rendering also um, kind of washed it all out. You don't really see any detail there. Mm -hmm. This this Makes it really hard to. Yeah, this elevation, you see a little bit more detail, but on the, the, um, the rendering from the street view, it definitely uh, masonry uh, vernacular. A little bit better on that, but I agree with you, Kristen. I'm not opposed to two story. No, I'm not. I'm not opposed to two story, story at all. Yeah. I, I agree. Like you know, we. Have I agree that. Is your mic on? It is. Mm -hmm. I agree that a single car garage doesn't work for everyone. No. But also, then the historic district doesn't maybe work for everyone. Yeah. Well, like uh, John said, I mean the lot can handle a two-car garage. I think it can handle, I mean. Um, I also wonder, though, if it were, if the two-car garage were set back and it was more clearly two separate doors, um, wouldn't the overall massing of the house maybe change visually? It just seems like the garage doors are so prominent Uh, something about it didn't well right. it's the width of the upper story so in on that street on the streetscape you don't have that um, vertical orientation on both sides that are right. equal it's <laughs> offset mm -hmm. you know the the weighting is on one side or the other and there's some there's some um, you know that doesn't that diminishes that massing effect so I'm just going to say what everybody else has already said, so I'll be brief. Uh, I think the visual compatibility uh, with the neighborhood is a serious problem, and to compare this to the, as you said, the new structures uh, to prove visual compatibility just doesn't work. You really have to look at the historic structures that have been there for 100 years or 75 years. Uh, so, uh, I, I don't think I'll be voting in support of this. What comes to mind when I see this is, again, proportion. Um, pretty much the top facade, the front facade is, except for a little jog, is like a flat surface. That's pretty visible from roof plan. Um, only the roof jots out a little bit. Um, so it's, it's going to read like a flat surface. Also. You know, the, um, the Borden Batten kind of dies into the eave really without any concern on how that, maybe a trim piece should, should be looked at. Again, looking at details and proportion, the columns on the ground floor being pretty skinny and out of, out of proportion. Uh, you got a lot of things going on. You got a Borden Batten going vertical. Uh, the the shutters above the front door are going horizontal. You got the gate on the right going horizontal. You got the vertical element of the garage door. So I think, I think, I think another, another shot at this is required. Um, not only proportionally, but you know, aesthetically to make it, make it, uh, make it work a little better. So question for staff. Um, is there any preference on, obviously, I don't think it has the support of the board right now. We could continue with direction. They could take another whack at it, bring back. That way they don't have to pay any more fees or go through the, another you know application would process. Would you like to ask the applicants if they would like to continue? Yes, please. We would like to I'd like to make a motion then. To May I say something before you do? Sure. Um, you've all given pretty specific direction that seems to be in line with each other. So you can either refer to that discussion in your motion. The applicant can listen back, plus we'll have minutes. Or you could summarize 
at this point. I think whichever's easiest if you're going to move towards continuation. Okay. Instead of making a motion, then I'd like to discuss just a few minutes further and maybe our new architect on the, the board could use some technical language when we, so basically from what we've been talking about, the, the garage is being so front forward and a two car single door are a concern, the massing of the second floor are a concern. Um, Proportionally, again, the columns on the ground floor. I the, agree with you on that 100%. They're just super thin. Um, I just, sorry, I just want to make sure when we're, when you guys are going through your guidance that we are sticking to kind of like general, so we're not designing it specifically, but speaking to like general that are reflected in like the design guidelines, like massing or proportionate to the streetscape, that kind of stuff, so that they can bring back in their mm -hmm. discretion um, something that kind of fits more with the board. Okay. Um, keeping elements to be uh, the same at the ground floor and versus the second floor. Been same orientation. Again, um, Can we add proportionate to the streetscape to your motion? In terms of proportion is compatible to the other frontages on that street right. or within the district? On that street. Right. I was just going to say, I feel like you've already said all that you need to say. Yeah, this is all recorded. So yeah. And I've been taking be notes. A painful detail on a motion. I took notes as well of okay. what you all said. I think we need to probably, probably have the direction. direction. No. So if you want to just say motion to continue with direction as noted. Michelle, do we need to go to a date certain? No. Okay. No, there's, a, it would give the applicant some time to do a four, five week turnaround is possible. But remember we have to review what they're submitting and write a new staff report memo also, we send you the agenda a week in advance, so it's possible they may be able to come back to the April meeting. Um, if we don't do date certain, then they come back as soon as they can. Very good. But there's no variance or, mm -hmm. or anything that would require notification for that. Perfect. Do you require a second? Uh, let, me, let me make a motion first. <laughs> so, I thought we heard that. Yeah. I would like to move, I was looking up for the item number. Uh, I would like to move that we continue item 8B uh, until, uh, you know, the applicant and staff are uh, uh, reconvene and the item is resubmitted uh, based on the conditions and on the um, conversation and direction provided by the board throughout this discussion. Second. Diane, we're ready for a roll call when you are. John Miller? Yes. Kristen Finn? Yes. Rhonda Saxton? Yes. Ivan Herrera? Yes. Jim Chard? Yes. Buddy Willis Hampson, Elise Lindstrom? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. All right. Um, and if we can. Moving right along, have the staff read in item 8C. Hi, good evening, Michelle Hoyland again for the record. Um, I'd like to enter file COA 2023-052, which is a certificate of appropriateness for 150 Marine Way. The applicant and their team are here and they're gonna pull some things together while I queue up their presentation. Mm. In the meantime, can we do ex parte, please? Um, I have spoken with the applicant's attorney and the applicant's agent. None. 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 All right. And you have a clicker there? Okay, you're good. All 
Brian Grossberg with Azure Development, 290 Southeast 6th Avenue, Delray Beach. And I'll just note that our office at 290 Southeast 6th was given an award from the state of Florida for historic preservation um, from the uh, Historic Preservation Trust for adaptive reuse. But uh, anyway, going on to 150 Marine Way, there's really two key items that I wanted to review. First was the use of the glass, um, both the color and the reflectivity that was used in the construction of this home, and also the fencing material that was used on the south property line, as well as a portion, a small portion of the north property line. This residence was built for Jackie Tudovin and Stephen Schachter. Stephen Schachter is here this evening. Um, so moving on to the, uh, just show you where the site is located. It's at the southern edge of uh, Marine Way, directly across from the intercoastal. The first thing I wanna go through is the window and door schedule from the Historic Preservation Board approved plans because there's really two very key notes. Um, I believe the staff report, both the first staff report from the January and then the, the most recent updated staff report really focus on the last point, but I really think it's key to look at both. The first point says all exterior glazing units shall be impact resistant with Florida product approval. Shading coefficient of glazing shall comply with Florida energy calculations. So the shading coefficient is basically the percentage of solar heat or infrared heat that's transmitted through glass. So what percentage of that heat from the sun is gonna make it to the interior of the home? And in today's environment, with the constantly being updated energy code um, and building code, you basically have to have low E glass in construction today in order to comply with the energy calculations and reduce the shading coefficient down to a reasonable level. But then taking into account the last item, all glazing is to be clear, non-reflectant. And when we use the term non-reflectant, at least within this industry, we're talking about glass that's not reflective glass. It's basically an industry standard term. Um, I have our window and glazing expert here this evening that represents just about every single product line that's used in residential construction throughout the United States. And um, the term reflective glass means, from an architectural term perspective, it means it has metallic coating that creates a mirror-like appearance that's often used in commercial settings. Um, to give them, mostly in office buildings, to give them privacy during the day and also cut down on the solar heat gain. That's definitely not what we were proposing or using or anything close to it, but I just wanted to say that term of how it's really used. And the architect, our architect on this, Richard Brummer, was actually the project manager under Richard Jones when this plan went through, and he actually developed those notes. So he can further attest to that and speak to that um, during the question and answers. So moving on. <coughs> Apologize. For me. Okay. So I really want to go through all the different glass options out there. The first point I really want to hit home is there's not a glass made today that is non-reflective. That does not exist. There is no glass that's non-reflective. All glass has a level of reflectivity. The lowest glass out there, which I'll show you in future slides, is really a, with, does not have a low E coating and does not have a tint. And that even has 8% reflectivity. So 8% of the solar rays that are coming and hitting that glass will be reflected back. Non-reflective glass does not exist. So if we're gonna take a very strict reading of that note and not use the industry standard term, there is not a product or substitute product that we can use even if we were asked to rip out all the glass on the home that we built. There's not a product that exists and Ken could speak further to that when he speaks in a few moments. So that's the first point I wanna make. The second point I wanna make is that all glass contains iron. It's the iron 
that when it, you, the sun reflects off the iron, creates a gray glass, or, or I mean, I'm sorry, a greenish hue. And even in you know, unnatural light, you'll see it. So this is a clear glass um, that Ken is holding up. It has no tint whatsoever, and it has no low E coating. And as you could see, it still has a level of green cast or green contrast to it. Now, I want to make a very important distinguishing fact here when you talk about tints, because there's reference in the staff report that it may have a green tint. I can assure you we do not have a green tinted glass. Tint is in the manufacturing pro uh, process of the glass itself. This glass and the glass on 150 Marine Way is clear glass. When you actually manufacture the glass, they're adding the tint. What it does have at Marine Way, and we're going to show you next, is clear glass with a low E coating. So this is actually laminated glass, and in between the two layers of clear glass that have absolutely no color, they do have iron, there's a low E coating to bring down the shading coefficient to a reasonable level for heat transmittance. Now what I want to show you next, well, I'll let Ken hold these two up, they're actually very heavy. So here you're seeing clear with no low E versus clear with low E. But more importantly, I now want to show you the clear, um, okay, now I want to show you a green tint that we're being told, you know, we think was used in our product, in our home. Um, so this is a green tint. Now you could see a green tint with a low E coating and really how green it really looks. Now if we can hold that up, if you can, I know they're very heavy, with the product we used, which was clear with a low E, you could see how much greener, and this is without the sun reflecting off it. When the sun reflects off it, it looks much, much greener. Um, you could see the difference between you know, a green tint and a clear, no tint product, both with low E. I just listed up here all the other products that are on the market. You have blue tints, gray tints, bronze tints, as you go down, we do have those other samples here. I don't think they're as relevant. If any of them want to see them, we'll be more than happy to share them with you. But they get darker and darker, so further away from what we were trying to achieve, which was a clear glass. Um, the other couple points I just want to make, and this is probably the most important point. Um, per the Secretary of the Interior Standards, which is noted at the bottom of the updated staff report on page 6, it, they recommend using low-E glass with the least visible tint in new or replacement windows. We exceeded that recommendation. We used no tint, and we did that by maximizing the energy efficiency of this home, which I'll go through all the steps we took and all the additional costs we incurred to make this home energy efficient. So again, they're recommending low-E glass, which is what we used, but they're saying the least visible tint we went a step further and used no tint. We also went to just about every manufacturer of glass that's being used and we looked for, through Ken, who actually represents um, all these manufacturers listed, and looked for the glass with the lowest reflectivity. So we were trying to basically find glass that can closest meet that non-reflective guidance that we were given um, with clear no tint. So PGT, CGI, ES, Marvin, I mean, all some of the biggest window um, companies in, in the country. We actually went with Marvin for this home. Okay. So here's the actual uh, characteristics of the glass that we used. So there's two glasses that we looked at, um, the clear low E um, glass, which is what we used, and then clear glass with no low E. And I just want to compare a couple important variables on this. Like I said, even clear glass with no low E still has 8% reflectivity, as I mentioned earlier. The glass we used has 14%. So yes, the reflectivity went up from 8 to 14% by going with the low E coating. But what is very important to point out, which was detrimental to meeting the energy code, is that our shading coefficient, I apologize, it's small print, but I believe it dropped from 70% to 32% um, by going with this. So now, instead of 70% of the sun's heat that it generates penetrating the glass and getting into the house, only 32% 
is getting in by just adding that low E coating and again not adding a tint to the home and that was really what was key in order to meet the Florida Energy Code. Um, I'm not aware of any new construction or even rehab construction being done in South Florida and Ken will attest to this um, that's using glass without a low E coating. It's simply you know we can't meet energy code with it. Um, there was question in definitely the first staff report and a little bit in the second saying that you know uh, we may have used something with a green tint. Here's our actual order that was placed for the glass in that home. Um, you could see it was through sun windows and doors. It was for Marvin glass and it was for clear solar band 70 glass. Clear meaning no tint. Solar band 70 is just the low E coating that was used on the glass. So again, I think because maybe the sliders that were approved on the front of the home are a little bit larger than some of the homes on the historic district, it may be looking or appearing slightly more green. And it also depends on the time of day because it's direct east exposure, you're across from the intercoastal, but it also depends if there's window treatments and if they're down and whatnot, it dramatically impacts the appearance of the glass. twice okay so this is a really important slide because I want to show you that we didn't just say okay we failed the energy calculations so we're just going to go with low E because it's a cheaper solution that's not the case we basically took every step possible in building this home to make it as energy efficient as possible first and foremost we use spray foam insulation on the top court of the roof trusses. What that does is it creates a cool attic environment um, because most insulation, whether it be blown in fiberglass or bat insulation that's rolled down, it's put on the lower court of the truss. So it's directly above your ceiling. So the attic gets really, really hot. That's not the case when you use spray foam insulation. It goes right under the roof, the roof um, underlayment, right under the, uh, the plywood, um, pressure treated plywood. So by doing that, you're basically reflecting the heat, you know, right before it even penetrates the attic. The cost to us is three times more than what typical insulation costs. The next thing we did, we utilized tankless natural gas hot water heaters in the home and in the uh, retreat area. So in lieu of, you know, less expensive, less energy efficient tank systems. This cost us about two and a half times more than your typical tank system. The next thing we did, we used highly efficient HVAC systems. They had variable speed motors, and they also had heat pumps instead of electric strips, which use way more electric. Um, these cost us um, approximately one and a half times more than your standard um, HVAC systems. The last thing we did is we used low E glass, which I've already talked about, which cost about 20% more than glass without a low E coating, but there was no other way around it. Okay, this is the actual energy calculations. And I'm gonna let Ken speak for a minute or two because I get a little more detailed, but it shows all the measures we took are in this, and it shows how we failed and passed with low E and without low E. So I'm gonna turn it over to Ken for a minute. I'm Ken Sandler with Sun Windows and Doors. I also do independent architectural consulting as a fenestration consultant uh, for architects around the country and around the world. Um, so th this is a, uh, uh, software that is uh, put out actually by the state of Florida that the mechanical engineers will plug in all of the, the performance characteristics of the, uh, the mechanical uh, systems of the house. And the energy code actually changed in 2012 um, where this was implemented. And since that time, we haven't been able to do really any houses without some type of low E coatings on them. And what, uh, what Brian has had, had their mechanical engineer do is rerun their calculations with just clear glass with no low E on the left-hand side, and it has all the other performance characteristics of the, the 
the envelope performance of the insulation, the HVAC system, uh, and the windows and doors. And on the left side, you can see down here on the bottom, it fails uh, fairly significantly. On the right side, it shows the, um, the solar heat gain with the low E coating on the clear glass, uh, and that's the only way that they can pass. So it, all of the other, as he was saying, the, the other things they did to make this house as energy efficient as possible, if they had just used clear glass, they still could not have passed the uh, energy code. Thank you, Ken. Yeah, no, I think that's the important point. In order to use the clear glass without a tint, we had to do all these other things. Um, so again, looking back to the Secretary of Interior Standards recommending using, you know, the least offensive tint, um, you know, we took it a step further by using these energy maximizing uh, tools to have no tint whatsoever. Probably have more experience where I should I be pointing this. Yeah, maybe I'll just tell you when yeah. to click. It'll be easier. We going okay. forward or back? I was trying to go forward. Okay. So um, at the top of page six of the current staff report, it says windows on structures located within historic districts are typically clear, with no appearance of color, tint, or reflectivity. So we went through the historic district and basically looked at everything that's been built definitely within the last five years. And every single example that we see has definitely low E glass and I would argue some of them have tints. Um, they did not use clear glass. So this is 42 Palm Square, appears to be darker than what we used. 128 Southeast 7th definitely appears to be darker than what we used. And you know, the list goes on. Um, I can't find an example anywhere that did not have a low E coating. Even homes with smaller glass where it's not going to be as apparent, like 73 Palm Square and 55 Southeast 7th Avenue, all have a low E coating if you go and look at those homes in direct sunlight. They all have the green hue. Um, this is 60 Palm Square, which was a rehab of an historic building, which is extremely dark. Um, and then I'm looking at 170 Marine Way, two doors down, the new structure that was added in the back definitely has a low E coating and may have green glass or may just be a low E coating. Um, also, you could see with the changes in climate change, you know, all the climate changes going on and changes in code, not only do you have to make these glass changes, but this was raised to a nine foot elevation, which definitely impacts the historic character of the neighborhood. You want to flip one for me or? <laughs> oh, there we go. Okay. Next, I'm going to just move on. I'll touch on this pretty quickly, the fencing material. So if you could see on the back side of the north property line, we did use a simulated white wood fence um, that is fabricated out of P PVC for durability. And we used it just in the rear on the north side adjacent to the garage structure. And on the south side, we used it probably for, you know, arguably 60 or 70 percent of the side property line. You can see it in red on this slide. Um, we did try to follow, you know, the land development regulations. When you read this section, it says non-historic and or synthetic materials are discouraged, particularly when visible from a public right of way. So we did use mature landscaping to try to screen it. And we also used a masonry wall to try to screen it as well from the right of way. I think what's more important and most important to look at for this fence is that we did submit an application for this fence to the city. It was clearly designated historic on the application, as you could see on the left side. And furthermore, on the right side for the permit, the fence permit, it clearly designated PVC. So it's not like we went and did this without the city's approval. Um, we received a permit for this fence. Not only that, during the construction, while it was inspected, nearing the end of the construction process, um, an inspector for the city of Delray Beach said it's too high, this was after you know other complaints were given from neighbors, that it's too high, we need you to cut it down. Nothing, not a word about the fact it was PVC. So we, had, we took on the expense and cut down the fence about two feet, 
and we redid the entire fence, not a word that it was a problem, that it was PVC. So after we had that expense, we finished the home, we were about to get our CO, and we were told we're not going to get a CO for these two reasons. And the only way you're going to get a CO is if you agree to pull the permit for the fence, which was approved. So being held, um, and the only way to get you know, Jackie and Steve into their home, who were displaced for some time waiting to get their home completed, was to agree to pull this permit that was approved by the city. So we went ahead and did it um, just to get them in their home. So, uh, you know, again, it's not something that we uh, try to sneak by and do without, you know, getting the proper approvals. It wasn't even, you know, none of this fencing or walls were actually labeled on the site plan um, when we went through the Historic Preservation Board. And with that, um, I just want to thank you, and I'll be available for any questions. Thank you. Okay, again, for the record, Michelle Hoyland, Principal Planner with Development Services. Okay, so the property is 150 Marine Way, which is located on the west side of the street between Southeast 2nd Street and Southeast 1st Street. Um, this is directly across the street from the city marina. This project came before the board a couple of years ago. Um, the history that was included with this was the applicant came through with a design proposal that was denied. They came there was a scale massing issue and they came back to the board with a revised proposal um, scaling the building down and in incorporating the board's concerns which the board did then approve and the property at the time it was moving through the process of co we have now at the city implemented a site inspector position that assists historic staff and goes out and does a site inspection this is something the board's been asking if we've been able to complete and we are improving our processes. It was during that site inspection for the CO that staff recognized there were some issues with respect to what had been constructed on site versus what the board approved. And so a code enforcement violation was opened. This occurred in August of 2022. The applicant submitted a COA, which is before you now in December, to um, come before the board and address asked for the board's assistance and, and approvals and addressing how to handle some of these issues. So the first issue is that the site plan approval docs, which I will show you and the applicant has um, testified to as well, indicated that the glass on this project, and we are interchangeably using the word tint and appearance, and I, um, we did make edits to the staff report over the February meeting, which didn't occur to call the word appearance because we don't want to split hairs over whether or not this is tint or low e coating the issue is that the windows have a green appearance um, so that's what's before you along with the use of the pvc fence material neither were part of the original board approval so you can see that here on this drawing on the bottom left um, which is the southeast corner of the property that is really the only place where the PVC fence is peeking out. It does sit on top of a retaining wall. Neither um, were indicated on their approved plan set. So I'm going to roll through pictures. This is predominantly here for the board in case you want us to go back and look at any series of photographs um, so that you can understand what was approved. This is the rear yard south side where the PVC fence was installed. This is a look at the back. Way back in the back there is an existing masonry wall, and that is there now. Again, some photographs of the green reflective windows here. You can see that color when looking through the windows and the reflectivity. There again is the PVC fence. This is on the north side up, up behind a masonry wall and aluminum gate. So first we're going to address the PVC wall or the PVC fence. 
This right here is the approved site plan. You can see what's in yellow was existing um, on the property to the north is where that existing masonry wall and aluminum fence combo is. And to the west on the left side of the screen is the other portion of it. Aluminum gates um, and fences were approved for use along with masonry as well. What's in red is where the PVC was installed. So then the north, it's, it's very far in the rear of the property. On the south, it does peak out. This same applicant um, developed a project just to the north, um, on the north side of the Marine Townhomes, 116 Marine Way. It was a duplex. I don't know if any of you were on the board at that time. Uh, but that project went through the process and they asked for the use of PVC when they came to the board and did get approval to use it. So the concern with the PVC is in relation to the Secretary of the Interior standards, the local visual compatibility standards, and in our LDRs it specifically states for fences that synthetic materials are discouraged for use, particularly when visible from a public right of way. The board has approved PVC fences. As of most recently, they have denied PVC fences. That doesn't mean that you can't approve the use of that material on a case by case basis, but that should be reviewed by the board for each project. So the concern is that that material is not an authentic material. Authentic materials typical for all of our historic districts and what we see most frequently is wood, metal, or some form of masonry. The Secretary of the Interior Standards, and I'm showing you throughout this presentation, those standards provide guidance for historic properties and for non-historic properties. Um, it's not a column that says, here's the application for historic, here's the application for non-historic. So we kind of have to weed through and look at all of those guidelines. In this case, we hold historic structures to a standard that their use of a substitute material needs to be an authentic material. It needs to ensure that it conveys the same appearance of any site features that existed um, and not be incompatible with a historic district. This is applicable to the district and the site, so whether you're historic or not, um, the recommended approach is utilizing materials that are unobtrusive as possible, um, and you should not be installing something that doesn't take into consideration the location and visibility that might have a negative impact on that historic district or the character of the setting. These are the local historic preservation design guidelines. We have included this screenshot because in our guidelines, it does state that new materials, some of them synthetic, may be approved by the board on a case-by-case -case basis. So now I'm gonna talk about the windows. Um, this is a, a snippet from the staff report. Staff's concern is that the project was approved by HPB where the glass would be clear, non-reflective with no tint. Essentially, it's a clear window. Um, that's to ensure compatibility with other historic structures in the, site, in the district. So it's, at this point, it's in the board's hands to decide whether or not the use of this material is appropriate uh, for the Marina Historic District. This is the window and door schedule. These are screenshots taken from the approved plans, the certified approved plans, where you can see that the frame is aluminum, it's white, glazing would be clear. The same is the case for the doors. This is at the bottom of the notes. Um, Mr. Uh, Grossberg in indicated that number one, all exterior glazing units shall be impact resistant with Florida product approval, shading coefficient of glazing complying with the Florida energy calculations. And we're going to talk a little more about that. But number 15 here says that the glazing should be clear, uh, non-reflectant, clear non-reflectant. So in the Delray Beach design guidelines, um, it this is called out for all structures, that materials should be compatible in color, quality, texture, finish, dimension to those commonly found within a historic district. Window types and patterns as well as their placement should be similar to surrounding buildings. 
These standards and guidelines are put in place to ensure longevity of that historic district so that in another 50 years, this structure could be looked at as a possible contributor. This is another um, application of the Secretary of the Interior Standards. This is applicable for an existing historic structure, not for new construction, which does not recommend changing the appearance of windows that contribute to the character of the building by replacing finishes, colors, noticeably changing the sash, the depth of the reveal, mutton configurations, reflectivity and color of the glazing or appearance of the frame. So we hold historic structures to a very high standard. New construction has um, some affordance, right, with, with compliance with the requirement of the Florida Building Code in addition to our base requirements for historic. But again, rehabilitation touches on, of a historic structure, touches on using low E glass with the least visible tint. So that's the standard. I just want you to remember we're holding historic to this particular standard. New construction, um, you have to ensure when you're doing your design that you don't duplicate an existing style too closely. You want to be able to tell that something is a new build, not that you're replicating a historic structure. And that might be something that the board considers with the use of this material, as, as you discuss, and we can revisit this once you move into board discussion. Um, because we're, we're dealing with modern materials now. We're dealing with new requirements of our building code that are mandated by the state of Florida. But I want to make it clear that part of the, and no pun intended, um, part of the thing that, that's occurring here is yes, there's a compliance with Florida energy calculations, but we don't want to forget where this project was when it first went to the board. There was concern at the time that there was a broad expanse of windows being utilized on the east facade. There was comments by staff and some comments by the board about those particular windows. So we're sitting here with a structure that has a, a broad expanse of glass along its east facade. These are a few snippets from the Florida Building Code uh, energy calculation requirements. I'm putting them here so that you understand we have spent time speaking with our in-house staff, chief building official, uh, plan reviewers and inspectors, and understanding this is not a new topic for this particular applicant. This is an ongoing topic that we're working through with all the applicants. We are in climate zone 1, 1A, in the state of Florida, and there's a specific um, component calculation that's put in place. This single page that you see that's an energy calc table, which I have a copy of, of their energy calc, is not a single page document. This is a multi-page set of standards. That multi-page set of standards for energy calculations is that that calculation is a sum of its components. This includes the type of construction. Are you new construction? Are you rehabilitation? What's your use? Are you residential, commercial? What's the location of your building? How many square feet is your building? What is your building envelope constructed of? Walls, roof, floors. What are your window and door types? What is their orientation? This calls out in, in the, the building code, north is a column, south, east, and west is a separate column. So the orientation of where the sun is going to come in on a, on a building as well as that area that the windows take up on a wall. Type of insulation utilized, your heating and cooling system, which in January, those requirements were updated. They're more stringent. Type of duct work that's used. Uh, your water heater, whether your tank, tankless, what's your energy rating on it? Electrical and power, it's a sum of components. So when an applicant says to us, we can't meet requirements for windows, they can adjust other things. They can change the way those windows are set in a wall and how big those windows might be. And this, I don't want it to appear, I think the applicant was being very clear that they spoke out all of their components, but I don't want the board to you know, be remiss in understanding that windows are not just the only thing that are looked at. 
So then staff went and looked at the Secretary of the Interior standards and what other guidance existed out there. And we landed on Preservation Brief 3, which is the energy calculation requirements for historic buildings. That does not provide a ton of guidance or any much at all for new construction, but there was a lot of discussion about what has happened over the last hundred years or, or more and how new modern buildings are being addressed in their construction. And what I've provided for you here is a screenshot from that document, which shows an older building in the thermal image on the left before that building was insulated. That building having the insulation on the right has cooled down, but you can still see that the windows are yellow or orange. That's where the heat is escaping from this building. The darker, cooler walls show that heat loss reduction. In this instance, we have a wall of windows where there's going to be more heat loss happening on the east side of their structure. So again, buildings are some of the components. This is a screenshot of the 14-page preservation brief that talks about what historic building methods were used, which are still used today, uh, maximizing natural sources of heat and cooling, light and ventilation. Back before ACs existed, they would have vents that might exist under a house to move air under a house. Ceilings were higher to allow heat to rise. Um, windows maybe were smaller. There, there were a lot of different approaches because people were starting to design for environment when we started designing. This is an age old adage. So this is another screenshot from that preservation brief three. Historic is held to a different standard. Some upgrades happen for historic, but they can't damage that historic fabric or alter the appearance of the building. New construction gets to start from scratch. They're not starting with a historic building. And in that image here, what I wanted to um, highlight for you is that windows account for about 10% of the heat loss that's happening, um, where air is escaping from the structure. And I also have a couple of photographs here. Hang on a second. Um, so we, we did some research. This might be an ongoing longer topic discussion because are we really going to be telling this developer and owner that they have to take out every single window in their building and replace them? I, I don't know what the board's decision is going to be. I don't know what the solution is. And that's why we're here. Um, but we are seeing projects. This is, if you remember, Miss Tracy Jansen with the Jenny House up on... Northeast 6th Street. Um, this is an example of the historic home on the left, and you can see the addition of the cottage in the f background over there. Um, those windows are clear, and you can see on her original structure as she bought it, it, the windows were a little more tinted. There is going to have to be probably some flex and give and some direction, and maybe an amendment to our guidelines or our LDRs. Um, that will probably have to be a separate discussion and staff is having that discussion with design professionals. We've heard from architects that could say we can get clear glass and other architects and design professionals and window professionals that are saying we can't get that product. Um, but here we can see that is a, not a green reflectivity occurring on those windows. There is a slight tint to them. So what's the lesser of the two evils? maybe we if we're going to move away from availability of clear glass if that's truly through our investigations once they're that's completed the case is the board okay with green maybe the board's going to say we're not we don't have a problem with a little bit of gray you know it we're going to have to set some kind of standard in order to be fair for every applicant that comes after because if there is an availability of product concern for them that it has to be addressed. We can't be putting a requirement on a project that's not feasible. But staff has not had a chance yet to do that complete investigation. We've spoken with a handful of professionals and the information's conflicting. So I don't have information to report. But I wanted to show this particular project because this was fairly close to clear and we weren't seeing green. We were seeing a, a tiny bit of gray in these windows. Okay. 
and I don't want to spend a, a lot of time rebutting um, their presentation. And I, I understand that they are saying staff is calling it tint and it's not really tint, it's a coating. Our concern is that there's the appearance of a color where clear was asked to be used. So however it was applied, whether it was in the glass, a layer between the glass, a tint put on the glass after the fact, the issue is that they're green and they're reflective. How, how they got to that point is more splitting hairs. It's the appearance of the bottom line that we're talking about. Um, so in your staff report, um, these are the findings on any project for a certificate of appropriateness, um, that that application needs to be consistent with the objective for 1.4 of the historic preservation element, which specifically calls out LDR section 451, um, the d historic pr preservation design guidelines locally, Del Rey's, and the Secretary of the Interior Standards for Rehabilitation. So I think that was that was a long presentation. I apologize. I know we're getting to be late here. So I'll move um, to complete and uh, move to public comment. Thank you. Oh, also, uh, you have an email that was here, um, letter, letter of support from the neighbor to the south. We printed that for you. Do we have any public comment? We go to public comment first, and then and then we'll the do rebuttal and cross examination. Uh, you would be an applicant response. They're the owners. Okay. Yeah. So, do we have any public comment? Anyone that is not um, one of the owners or architects or somebody involved in the project itself? Okay. Um, so, staff, do we have re rebuttal or cross examination? I really covered, you know, this in my my presentation, um, so I, I'm okay. Thank you. Okay. Our director and Thea Giannotis. Hi. Go ahead. So I think hi, and Thea Giannotis, Development Services Director. I share uh, same alma mater as your new uh, board member, University of Miami School of Architecture. Um, and so I, I do think that um, we need to have a larger discussion in general about this. We need to resolve this issue for this applicant moving forward. And I, I think you've, what you're hearing from us is a basis that the world is changing, materials are changing and they're upgrading. Um, you may be aware that the city has passed a new green building ordinance. Um, historic properties are exempt from this. The greenest building is the one that lasts 100 years, so Roger's not gonna have to bring a scorecard to his building permits to prove certification. But I think what a lot of people don't realize is that the Florida Building Code itself, particularly for single family, is constantly raising and adjusting energy requirements as well that people are trying to navigate. Um, I do think that um, in an effort to appease the, the uh, review that happens, stopping with the historic preservation team, um, we're having the same issue, just as a side issue, with retail streets not having reflective glass downtown. It has nothing to do with historic, but it's the same issue. So this is why we're going to talk glass quite a bit lately. Um, however, when you give us notes, and note 3 says we're going to do it to this version, and note 15 says, but it's going to be clear, it's very easy for these types of situations to arise. It just is because staff is going, okay, it's clear, and that's what they told the board. And this little note results in something that looks less than clear. I don't think that anybody is trying to be dupli duplicitive. It's that we have competing regulations now that we're trying to figure out what is the best result from it. So we're very interested in your comments. We need to resolve an outcome for this applicant. There's other architects here that are probably going to want to comment and participate, but we are going, at least I'm going to reach out to my leadership to see about um, scheduling, you know, and it may have to be a, a workshop that includes more than this board because we're having the same issue with downtown retail gla glazing as well. Um, I just wanted to put that forward. This is, you know, this is not going to be the last time I think we're gonna see this issue because technology is advancing. The world is changing and we need to figure out the materials that can best be used. 
to address what's happening. Um, I think what is unique to this board for future applications, the impact of a, of a wall material, because your wall enclosure is part of those energy calcs, you need to be paying attention to the rhythm of solids and voids, because what may appear a more modern detail on a building may get doubled down with the type of glazing it takes to meet the ever-increasing standards of energy, aside from this building, just moving forward. So thank you. I'm sure there's rebuttal. Applicant? Yeah, I just want to make two quick notes. The image that was put up of the home um, that looked like it didn't have reflective glass or coloring. It's very important to note at that image, especially on the right side, I don't know, Michelle, if you could put that back up, it would be very helpful, I'd appreciate yeah. it. But that image on the right side had the window shades down. That dramatically changes the reflectivity of the glass when you have a window treatment down. So it's almost unfair to look at a home comparing 150 Marine Way when there's no window treatment down, depending on the time of the day, because they do have window treatments in their home, to a home that has the window treatment. So if you look at that home on the right, I see the window treatments down. And that completely changes the look of the glass 100%. So I think you should take that into account. The other note, which um, Anthea just brought up, which I think is very, very key, is that you do need to look at the amount of glass on the facades because I could tell you after going through this exercise for countless hours trying to figure it out there is no substitute we can use on that home as built today I think the decision should have come at the board level and said we can't have this much glass on this home when we went through the first time I didn't realize it at the time as the applicant but the only way to make that home work would have literally been to probably have 50 percent less glass on the entire home um, or less. So we'd literally have to block up all the wall, you know, all the openings on that home, at least 50%. I don't know. We'd have to rerun the calculations. But in order to make it work, you'd literally need to just close up all the glass or design something with just tiny little windows. So with that, thank you. It's definitely a learning exercise. Um, I'm not sure. I've looked at the Jenny house and I respect the comment about the shades being down I didn't notice reflectivity um, so perhaps we'll go back and look at that um, we have seen reflectivity on other projects that the shades were down I'm I just don't know I can't speak to that um, but yeah this is from the applicants presentation um, and this this will be part of the larger discussion what what is the board going to find acceptable and that's I don't know that we can have that complete discussion during this particular applicant's request, um, but thank you. You look like you're really ready to go. Oh, I was just um, curious that it's the board's fault now for allowing the house to be built. I know. I'm like, <laughs> where was the architect? <laughs> and I'm being somewhat facetious, but uh, I, that's that's. I think that's I do remember argument. the board. Like that was a major concern, though, at the time was that those windows weren't really appropriate and the board would have preferred less windows. Yeah, I think at the time we were talking about where's the front door, we were calling it the trick or treat trust test. Mm -hmm. And the applicants made some adjustments to make the front entrance more clearly delineated. That was part of the discussion. Um, so I don't, I don't know if that rings a bell, too. Yeah, I got a quick question for Michelle before. Um, we get into it but the applicant has said that and personally we'll discuss the windows I don't have as big a problem with the windows as the fence the fence did receive a building permit so um, <laughs> <All right. laughs> okay so um, the fence came in with a landscape permit and it was reviewed by the landscape uh, planner at the time who's no longer with the city and just didn't flag that it needed to go to historic now um, I do want to give some credit to uh, Michelle who figured out um, a way to add a code into the city system using the parcel numbers of every historic property in the city and get that implemented with the IT department so that when a property comes in the first thing that pops up, they can't even get past the screen on the permits anymore without flagging. We know it's historic, so it goes there. So we've closed that gap. 
Um, but ultimately, it was a page in a landscape uh, planet and just wasn't properly routed. Um, that said, that said, our our you know design professionals are responsible for you know what they're building and where they're building it as well. We're we're checkers at that aspect. Um, but it, they did receive approval. Um, it did not go through your historic staff though. So, thank you. Mm -hmm. Can I jump in? Was the applicant going to speak? He already rebutted, I believe. Oh, I think you mean the owners. Did the owners want the an owners opportunity to speak? Would you like? Yes, I'm sorry. Yep. Please. Would you, um, you uh, go. I guess this is fine. Oh, okay. Thank you for doing that. No, thank you. Um, I'm Steve Schachter, and this is Jackie Tudevin. We're both uh, work here. We're both anesthesiologists at Delray Medical Center. I've been here for about 20 years, and um, I really <clears throat> appreciate uh, and respect all these rules and regulations. I certainly don't know the lingo. This is foreign to me. But uh, we started this process two years ago, and um, what I note in the neighborhood is I see just a tremendous amount of inconsistency. This is what all I know. I don't know what historical is. But I see just a tremendous amount of inconsistencies along Southeast 7th Avenue. I see modern, new construction, what it looks like to be modern. I see a PVC fence along uh, this is Southeast 2nd Street. I see artificial turf in front of an entire lawn in front of uh, Palm Square. So what I'm trying to say is I don't know all the rules and regulations. All right, I don't know your lingo, but I see so much inconsistency among just our two streets uh, in the historical area. Somehow, uh, undue attention has come across this this house. I, 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 the house was originally uh, disqualified for the bronze medal, so I don't know if you recall that. So it was not immediately approved. They disqualified the bronze medal and we subsequently went to white and to uh, uh, white framing. <clears throat> but um, I'm, I got to tell you uh, that uh, Richard Jones, uh, rest his soul, and Azur should be very proud because every single person that walks by this house absolutely loves it. They stop and take pictures. This is, this is not, you know, we didn't do this. This is Azur and Richard Jones. It fits in beautifully with the marina district. Not, I don't know why there's a green roof on the boathouse of the marina. So all I'm trying to say is there's inconsistencies. There's got to be, you, you know, it, it just doesn't make sense to me how come there's so many inconsistencies. And it must be because it's, there must be some subjectivity depending on who's the board and when the and when it was approved but that doesn't that's not correct that's not correct it, it needs to be more objective because if I look around and I see uh, tinted windows on another street artificial turf in front of a lawn I, I don't I don't get it but anyways we love our home we uh, the neighbor the neighbors love our home so we uh, we hope to you know continue uh, you know, it's, it's the last thing we want to really be worrying about right now. So, thank you. Thank you. Staff, any rebuttal? So, I don't have rebuttal, but I would like to. We haven't met in person, I don't think. Um, the owners, staff is always here for any questions. Um, we tell all of our owners the same thing, which, and Roger's heard me say it, and long after the project's built and you're living in it and you're you know you're part of that historic district which i think you said you've been for 20 years in the neighboring property um we're here for you so a phone call questions those are we're actually going to cover artificial turf later in our meet after your item i have an update for the board but we're here for you as your resource um any questions that you might have or we want to put a new fence in. How do I do it? Please feel free to call us so we can help you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. 
um, board discussion now officially if you'd like to continue. Okay, so um, I, I, I appreciate the applicant coming up and, and, and the developer and trying, trying to uh, present their point. A um, couple of technical issues. Uh, you're absolutely right, Michelle. The, the, the code, the energy code is a compilation of calculations, right? And it's not just the glass. It's the size of the mechanical equipment. It's the number of fans, ceiling fans in the house. It's the, it's the water heater. So all that can be manipulated to pass. So what's happening is, what seems to be happening is the size of the windows, as originally was brought up, is, is way too big. And instead of capitulating to that and understanding that, you know, it was kind of like built that way. So um, that being said, the besides the size of the windows, uh, the, the tint. So I think, it, and I'll ask the fenestration consultant, I think all the glass, this type of glass comes from Columbia. So I understand that um, you went through all the manufacturers, but most of this glass, at least my experience is it comes from, you know, um, off season, you can select the le level of tint as you guys, uh, uh described. So, um, that could have been adjusted at that time. And then finally, there's this level of checks and balances for the whole approval process, right? So the plans go to the manufacturer. And the manufacturer looks at the plans and says clear, clear, clear glass. And that's what they're going to supply to the job site. But at some point, someone changed that or overrode that, the plans, and stamped the shop drawings approved with non-clear glass, because this is non-clear glass. This has some level of tint or coating or whatever we want to call it. So while I appreciate the applicant and the developer and the consultant coming up. I, I think the, the blame, if you will, lies somewhere else other than the board. I think someone else kind of overrode what was the intent of the plans as approved. Um, and look, we run into conflicts all the time in construction, right? So this beam is in conflict with that duct and and all you do is pick up the phone and says, hey, listen, what is, what is, what's your intent of the plans before you order, you know, a $100,000 package of windows? Uh, and if there is a conflict, I've always understood that you go with the stricter rule in the plans. So if there is a conflict you, and it says no clear, no, no tinted glass, you go with no tinted glass, even though there is a conflict. So I... I do feel for the applicant because now they have, they put the problem in our footstep, right? Um, so I'm curious to see what the board has to say, but I, I wanted to give a little bit of perspective of how things work in the background. Um, that, I mean, there is culpability on the folks that did approve these plans and did decide to install these windows. Um, the manufacturer would clearly see it's, it's a clear window and that's what they would provide. So at some point, someone said, no, I'm going to override that. And it's not fair that the board now has to deal with this. That's for the windows. For the fence, I think that uh, the way I feel is, um, you know, in, in the rear of the property, if it's not really a big issue, but anything that's visible on the side, maybe we can reach some sort of a um, you know, compromise if you will, and uh, maybe provide some sort of material, anything that's visible from the street. But so those are my comments. I, I agree. Now I got a question on the glass itself. Is this, we know the thickness, is this three eighths, half inch, two ply with a, um, a seam or something in the middle to create the uh, impact resistance? Oh. All glass is, is impact is essentially two layers of glass with yep. a layer. Um, you can just go back oh, toward I, the oh, microphone. I, I, that way you're I'm, on video. Sorry about that. Um, right. So all all, all impact glass is 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 uh, 
monolithic glass that's not insulated, there's two pieces of glass with the inner layer, and that's what pr provides the protection against the impact. Um, to, to your question, as far as clear as the overriding um, concern, the energy code is our number one it, the overriding everything. We, we cannot not comply with the energy code. So when uh, plan calls for clear, then that is going to be clear glass with a low E coating to comply with the energy code. Uh, tinted glass will go to a gray. I'm glad that he's brought the samples because we utilize these and have little tiny ones that we show applicants. Uh, uh, I, I, I think about it. Uh, though this, this is actually uh, a bronze. We, we didn't have it. Thought we had a gray. We didn't have a, a gray. But this is very similar to uh, having a, a gray tint. So, and you can definitely see that it's it's darker. Uh, do you want me to, I'm you want to hold, hold that much. one? I'll hold right. this. <laughs> Thank you. Right, but so as you're tilting it, I can see that. You get different reflectivity depending on rainbow the, coating on on where you're looking at. So. Uh, like with, with some of the pictures that we're seeing, if you look at it at an upward angle and you have a blue sky, you're going to see much higher appearance of reflectivity than if you're looking at it straight on or if there's reflecting something that's darker behind you. So the, the low E coatings are essentially a very, very, uh, uh, it, it, it's a two or three layer uh, silver molecular coating, very much like silvering to a mirror, but they are what is called a uh, spectrally selective. It reflects the most amount of infrared, which is the heat, and allows the most amount of uh, visible light to come through. So th they've really come a tremendous way over the past 15 years in developing the, these coatings to allow the most amount of visible light through, minimal amount of reflectivity, and the most amount of uh, infrared reflection. So the solar heat gain, which is what we care about most here, and in, in some of these, uh, it's calling for, this one is 0.32. I saw one of the other uh, slides you had up, it was calling for 0.25, which is actually less than this, this can uh, provide. So you actually have to go to an insulated uh, low E coating, which is this layer plus another layer of glass. So the energy code is really what's ruled our lives in the, uh, in the glazing industry for the past, since 2012. Can you, can you uh, do you mind if I ask the applicant a question? Is that okay? Um, can you meet energy calculations without any low E coating? No. So all windows have to have low E coating? Uh, in some cases, like going back to having less glass, uh, some of the more traditional houses, where, a lot of the houses that you so, showed pictures of where there's just a single, single hung window, called punched openings, um, you can use a tinted glass mm -hmm. so where you have a dark gray tint. Mm -hmm. It's enough to just barely pass if you don't have very many windows. Because that's what I've been seeing is the dark gray tint option and there's no reflectivity, although we are seeing some clear products come through without that green re reflectivity. So that's where we're still learning. How are they getting that product? How are we seeing clear glass you don't have very many windows yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Michelle I think we need to not go back I mean, I just, and forth. It's, it's yeah. very complex if the board topic. has questions you it's guys can ask them definitely I'm, I'm interested to talk to you more I'd, I'd love to talk to you after after yeah. this at some point because um, I, I, I do independent consulting and this but is basically the product nice. isn't even available is what we're hearing you can for this that's where I was trying to go Are you saying it won't pass the energy code for this house, or it won't pass the energy code for Any, Florida? In the, in the United States. Okay. Well, I, I, and Great. I think Ivan was spot on, though, because the window square footage on this house is so large, there was no other way to make it even reasonably energy efficient without putting some type of coloration or, or cause it, it, there is a slight tint to the window. There's no doubt about it. It's not clear. I mean, I work for 3M. I understand window tint. It's not tinted in a traditional sense. Right. Yeah, um, I think you see that the edge right. here. Unless, unless he asks you a question. Um, this yeah. is board uh, well, discussion. I was going to comment. Discussion. You can see on the edge, it's clear. And in the center area, there absolutely is coloration in there. So, however, 
my opinion is, at this point, at least for this project, I'm not about to mandate that somebody rip out all of these windows and replace them with clear because there is some slight coloration in there. Um, I'm just not, and I don't, I, don't, I don't know what the rest of the board thinks, but that's, that's not where I want to go. The fence, I was having a much bigger problem with than the windows. However, the mitigating factor is they got a, they got a approval and they got a permit. Um, you know, would it be great to have that eight foot section there replaced with wood? Nothing wrong with that, I would, I, but I wouldn't mandate it simply because they got permission to do so and they already cut it down already. So you know what, shame on us for, or shame on the city for letting it slip through. I would not have approved it. And uh, you know, if it was coming to us in the beginning, um, you know, I would, I would, and I'm not gonna ask the applicant to replace an eight foot section of it. I would think they would like to because it would look better and would fit in with the neighborhood. But um, those are just my two issues. I mean, you know, I, I personally thought this one was, was different and challenging because it's coming back after everything's been done and if they had not gotten permission they said there was going to be a wood fence and they put up pvc i'd say rip it out today but that's not the case and that's not what happened they got a permit to do it and the windows i think there's enough fuzziness there on what was approved and the thickness of the glass and the energy coefficient and everything else um, you know, I would just say this is a cautionary tale for anything else that comes before the board going forward. That's my thought. So I'm, I'm in favor for approving both, both uh, sections. So on the fence, though, I, I mean, I understand that it did go through permitting, but at the same time, they knew that they were supposed to be coming in front of the board for really everything, and it wasn't on the site plans, and it wasn't, you know, it wasn't approved. So I have a, a little bit of a hard time. With that, you know, it's like, well, if somebody mess, somebody missed something, so we're going to slide it through, kind of a, a feeling. Um, but my other concern actually kind of comes back to what the um, homeowner said, is that I, I do see his point that things are starting to be a little bit all over the place. Sorry, things are starting to be a little bit all over the place, uh, to the homeowner's point. And my concern is that that's happening because we're giving direction, we're stipulating what needs to be done, it's not being done, and then we're going, oh, well, we don't wanna make you tear something out, we don't wanna make you go through the expense, and since I've been on the board, that's happened with I'm not just windows, but lots of different things, and then I think that's where you get that look in the neighborhood where it's like, well, what is okay and what isn't okay, because this passed or maybe this didn't pass, but it's still there, so I, not to say that any particular thing sets a precedent, but at the same time, I, I understand how it's becoming very confusing. I, I, I agree with that. I haven't seen too many come back where we've granted permission rather after the fact, it, but I've only been on the board this time for a short period of time. Mm -hmm. um, but but to, the, to the applicant also, to the homeowner, you know, these neighborhoods were developed over, you know, decades. So what was put in in the 70s before it was a historic district is different than what went in in the 30s or the 50s or the 80s or after it was a historic district in 88 or 89. So, and then there's stuff that happens that we don't know about. It just gets done. Right. right? Well, that's what so, I'm saying is I feel like just because it gets done doesn't mean that it's... No, it doesn't mean it was okay. approved or okay <laughs> or anything like that. And it's kind of like... It's kind of like... Um, know uh, a code enforcement it's a complaint based system right so until somebody complains about it and brings it to the board's attention we don't know you know like we're going to talk about the, uh, the artificial turf later right okay and we'll, it does seem like they knew we'll that they were out. supposed to have clear because they started out with those energy calculations somebody like out with like clear. Evan said somebody well, made a decision somewhere. And, I'll, and I'll say to that effect about the clear glass portion um, when you go before which I have as a homeowner in the last two years Clear glass, it's hard to come by. Um, we come up against, there's only two that I know of companies, when I call to get someone to come out because we want to now replace the other side of our house that doesn't have impact windows, 
Mm. When they come out, they say, no, that's historic, and they leave. I mean, I've had pre presentation people sit in my living room and they pack up their little bag and they leave because it's hard to get. However, it is available. You just have to find the right company. And I have clear glass on my new construction. Um, it's past the code or whatever. I don't have these massive windows, but it's hard. I mean, and that's part of living in a historic district. It's not easy. It's not for everybody. You have to follow the rules. I'm not saying we are perfect. We haven't always followed the rules. But when these, pro these plans came before, the clear glass was on the plan. So now what do we do? That's right. the question at hand. I agree. No, I, I have the feeling that the, the applicant and the owners are kind of caught in the middle of our, our debate uh, or with Anthea's leadership and, on, on the staff, and we're trying to hold them responsible for something that we're not, no pun intended, uh, clear about. Uh, and uh, Michelle, I really appreciate the tutorial you gave us this evening. Um, I was flipping back and forth and back and forth as you, you went along on this and one thing that you you did say that I noted here uh, from the Secretary of Interior I believe this is what I heard you say using low E with minimal tent I think was the exact quote so that, that and is, and just oh, go ahead. the the rest of that sentence is as I heard from the applicant there is almost by definition a tent in the eye of the beholder, uh, when you have low E, that it's just part of the fact of how you do that energy efficiency. So I'm not sure, if we leave out the expanse of glass argument, I'm not sure what other solution there would have been uh, as per your discussion and the presentation other than putting in a low E class Gray. that does have some reflectivity and to the eye of the beholder can have some tint to it well I think if and I feel like there's a question in there if I can respond is, is that there okay a question too? there's a clear uh, there's a, a question in there that she's going to answer clarification <laughs> if you'd Clara. like to <laughs> yes please do this is not a 2023 or 2020 or 2018 problem. This is a problem with window glass that has existed since we've been using windows. Because years ago we had leaded glass mm -hmm. or we had reeded glass. And then that material slowly became hard to get. Not completely unavailable, but almost impossible. And you can go to Philly and look at a historic building that has leaded glass and there's a replacement pane and it's not. You can drive up on Seacrest and Gulf Road in Boynton and look at the little medical building on the northwest corner that had all gray pane windows, and one of them is not gray. So I think that's the larger discussion that might have to happen outside of this item with this applicant. What is going to be the material availability that the board is going to accept for approval. And I think it might end up being, in further conversations we have, it may end up being gray. Because we're seeing a lot of gray happen without the reflectivity or the green color. So we don't have an answer right now, but you asked about that um, Secretary of the Interior standard, and it does say, now again, this is for rehabilitation projects, historic structures, not new, using low E glass with the least visible tint and new or replacement windows. So it, it does reference the idea that there's going to be a tint because the standard is for clear. Um, so we've got to have more discussions, I think. I'd like to take one step back even further, though, and we're not going to solve this tonight, but I find it a little bit ironic that we're talking about energy efficiency and the um, sustainability argument in the Marina Historic District, which because of sea level rise, which is undeniable, is at risk in itself. So that's why this house is built up four feet, five feet over the neighboring house. 
because the whole neighborhood is at risk. And I think the energy efficiency argument will probably win out over, you know, slight tint and windows in a historic district at some point. So we got to look at the big picture too. And, and Anthea was correct that that's the way things are going. So, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm fine with the windows and I'm reluctantly fine with the, the, uh, I, I agree with you. I just also think that that's, that's not our decision to make. That is a further conversation for staff and for, um, you know, code to be updated and everything else to be updated. Absolutely. But we're so, here tonight to we, yeah, I just go home at some point. Yeah, I just think we need to stick to the current task at hand. So, I mean, the other question is if we deny this, then undoubtedly it's going to be appealed to commission and how is that, you know, so then that, that goes up another level. So. But I'm not sure that's part of our consideration. It's not, it's, but it's, you know, it's what's going to happen. So. Yeah, I, but so I like the way you say that because I feel like then that is our recommendation on the record of... You know, I, I think that you know, I would do the same thing. I would appeal it, but. <laughs> I wouldn't rip them out without Of course. <laughs> and so that's where I think that we are stuck between a hard and a, between a rock and a hard place of, I can't imagine as a human being telling someone that they needed to rip out all of that glass. But at the same time, it, it is, it's, things are getting out of hand and how do we deal with it? So that needs to be the further conversation. As far as tonight, I'm not going to be voting to tell them to rip out their glass but it, it definitely we need to have a, a way of dealing with this mm -hmm. if it happens again and we need to have new standards if this is the direction that building is going well there are, there have been historic districts or buildings in historic districts and i'm thinking delight in particular that fully reflective tint glass has been installed and it is still there Sir, sir, this is board discussion. You can't be speaking from the. You I'm can't sorry. be speaking. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, you're not. You're not helping your cause. Yeah. All right. So um, the building, that building was the impetus behind the clear glass requirement by the board, and when we went back and did research, that building actually had reflective mirror tint windows, mm -hmm. and so when the owner put redid the windows and put. Oh, mirrored right. tint windows in she was putting in replacing exactly what it had um, but to the point if I could quickly say the idea of something going on appeal the applicant has expressed to staff that they would appeal a denial but it's somewhat of a tiny bit of a strategy on my part it tells the commission that you're struggling with something and that it needs further study I, th I think they need to make their determination based on what you think yeah. is yeah. historically right. appropriate and meets the LDRs and the design oh, guidelines yeah. and you know. evaluate it in that That's, reference and not think this is what I'm saying though if you if the board is making a decision because something doesn't meet the requirements of if something doesn't meet the requirements of the code that's what I'm saying. This is what the chairperson has said that they can make that action. Yeah, I have and a I question think that for you guys Ivan, if that's okay. Yes, so back ahead. into board discussion. In a situation like this, would it ever work to have the clear glass on the front facade of the home and maybe minimize the number of windows in some other parts to get that? Um, to obtain the passing grade on uh, so again I'm not an expert at energy and I think there's a fenestration expert if, if you want to ask but the way I've seen it happen is the entire envelope of the building gets evaluated under this this code energy code and again like Michelle said it's the insulation you could have insulated the heck out of that building it's the size of the fenestration it's size of the mechanical units it's the water heater so all that gets added up and factored into a number which is what they showed on the screen and maybe they didn't do some of those things i don't know uh, without seeing the plans i mean there's no way of me telling but we're being asked to judge on windows when in fact they could have solved it maybe in other ways but we don't know well i Having gone through a smaller scale of this same dilemma, 
in a renovation that I did in an older home, um, there was no way we could pass. We just couldn't pass. Right. Mm -hmm. So right. we eliminated three windows, and then we passed. Right. So yeah. there are other ways rather than just to go out and buy whatever you want to buy and put them in and then say, oh, well, this is the only solution we could find. Right. And well, that's where I'm having a problem. Right. And, 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 and to your point, the anger is not, should be, shouldn't be directed at the board. We didn't, we didn't cause this. It should be at right. someone else, some other professional, but we, we have to make the decision, unfortunately. But. And I, I think we, we shouldn't be dealing with a hypothetical of other windows or more windows or in the back or in the front. We need to address what we have right in front of us. Good point. Yeah, I mean, yeah, there's other ways to have done it, but the, the huge wall of windows in the front certainly didn't help. So. For that point, Jim, do you have a? I can do it. Oh. Uh, you need the motions up? I was just going to read it from okay. here. Unless you wanted to. No. I just meant are we doing the windows and the fence together? It's all one request. Yeah. You can make any additional conditions mm -hmm. should you wish. And I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut board dis discussion short. No, no, that was, I'm finished. Time. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I move uh, approval certificate of appropriateness 2023-052 for the property located at 150 Marine Way, Marina Historic District, by finding that the request and approval thereof is consistent with the comprehensive plan and meets the criteria set forth in the land development regulations. So, period. <laughs> Diane, roll, please. Oh, I'm and, sorry. No, second. Yeah. Is there a second? I'll second for purposes of a vote. <laughs> what does that mean? That's like a. You gotta have, if, if there's no second, then the motion Diane, dies. please. But this way we can vote. John Miller? Um, <laughs> yes. Mr. Finn? No. Rhonda Saxton? No. Ivan Herrera? Yes. Jim Chard? Yes. Claudia Willis is absent. Elise Lindstrom? Yes. Okay, moving on, um, we do not have any legislative items. Uh, reports and comments are next meeting, and um, if, if the applicant would, I don't know if the chair wants to say it, but as we're moving on. Yes. Yeah. The next meeting is April 5th. You just took right over, so I was fine with it. Okay, April 5th, 2023. Um, the board has asked about some updates on what are the requirements for artificial turf, so I've provided a, a quick presentation for you. Um, we have reviewed uh, internally through meetings with our director, landscape, uh, senior landscape planner, and other staff members, including engineering, uh, analysis of our code to see what specifically is allowed. How are we applying the requirements of the code? So the terminology artificial turf is not defined in the LDRs, anywhere in the LDRs. Um, the word turf is only used three times and it's not used in relation to artificial turf. But artificial turf does require a permit because typically it's valued at more than $1,000. So if you are doing an improvement to your property over 1,000, you have to have a building permit. 25% um, open space, our definition for that is that it has to be natural areas. That's real plant material. Artificial turf is not considered a natural area, so it would not be permitted as part of the 25% open space requirement. Above and beyond the 25% open space, you could have artificial turf. However, there are other caveats that kick in. It can be counted towards pervious, so this is areas that percolate water through them for drainage. Um, it's discouraged for use in front yards and swales. Engineering will not approve it for use typically in swales. The code does not allow more than 25% of your front or side street setback area to be anything other than natural plant material. This is not really clear cut. 
Okay, this is difficult. Sorry I asked to begin with. No, I'm glad you did because I'll show you why. This has been hard for our staff, our inspectors who are going out and, and doing those inspections and plan reviewers. Um, it is a material that's been interpreted to be cleaner than mulch. Um, typically, it, it's been permitted where you can have shaded areas because it does get hot. Um, and it doesn't allow, those shaded areas may not allow other natural materials to grow. Uh, putting greens, is, it's been used in the application. Uh, I've already said it's hotter to touch. Again, engineering doesn't allow it within the, those swales, particularly within the right of way, um, because it doesn't always percolate. It might hold water. Um, but so they have to do that review when a permit comes in. The Secretary of the Interior Standards and Guidelines, we reviewed the entirety. Um, and it touches on altering buildings or, and their features or site features, which are important in defining the overall histor historic character of a property. Um, it's not recommended to use non-natural materials or things that would diminish a character. And in particular, you can see on the left, grass is actually called out here. It's that you retain those natural materials. So we could establish some quantitative limits that detail where it can be used, as well as providing a definition in Appendix A of our LDRs. The City Commission is going to have their election here this month, and then they will set their calendar. The rest of the year's calendar has not been set. Um, that's going to occur after the organizational meeting on March 30th, so we'll have an idea of, of their upcoming workshops, but we're anticipating a discussion on trees in residential districts to occur, and we would like to talk with them about this particular um, standard and how, how we can apply it, and we do expect that we are going to be moving forward with a text amendment. The other piece of my... Um, analysis was I reached out to certified local government so for those of you who maybe don't know what that is um, when you are a historic community certified by the state of Florida like we are to have a historic program there are other communities like that and they're called CLGs and we have like a clearing house email that we all email on and say hey what are you doing about this or has anybody had something like that so I sent out a all points bulletin, I guess, and said, what's happening? And we heard back, um, this is our staff spreadsheet. It's not, it wasn't created for you. This was created for our own research so that we could start preparing some type of amendment. Um, Fort Lauderdale, Jupiter, Orlando, St. Augustine, West Palm Beach, and Winter Park all replied that they either have standards that are codified, were just codified, or in the process of becoming codified. I think the city of Orlando is probably the most streamlined and neatest language. Um, so we got a copy of their ordinance and we'll possibly be bringing something like this forward for amending the code at some point in the future, which I've talked about with our director. So what does that mean? I wish the applicant had stayed for this discussion because he asked about artificial turf. What does that mean for what's happening now? Um, if they check all the boxes that I described to you way back here on this first slide, they can use it in these areas. So it might be used in front yards. Those other communities, most of them are not allowing it for use in front yards. Um, Orlando's is, like I said, probably the, the best gold standard there. Um, so that's my update on that for you. Are there any questions? Could I have something after this too. Thank you. No, I don't think the applicant's coming back. He's done with this board. Yeah. Could could you summarize what uh, it's so small? It's a little hard to see, but what like it looks like city of Fort Lauderdale is opposed to using artificial turf in historic areas. That that says. Yeah. So they um, utilize their own historic preservation design guidelines that has language which discusses the appropriateness of landscape elements and that states that landscape elements should complement a building's architectural style so they cite that reference in their staff report to discourage artificial turfs use for historic properties but they are remember 
This board's only reviewing landscape plans for commercial and multifamily, not single family and duplex, which is mo most commonly the calls and complaints that we're getting are on those, which go straight to permit. They don't go to the board. And something that I wish she was here to hear me say it because I want to make sure she gets credit for this because it's Anthea who says it and it's a great sound bite is we shouldn't be making, I think board members have said it too, we shouldn't be making historic preservation harder, right? We should have cl clear rules and guidelines so that people can follow them and understand what they mean. Yeah. If, if, if it's too difficult, either people will just simply break the rules and not go through permitting or do anything like mm -hmm. that, oh, they, or they, they do. will avoid historic districts, and there will be resistance to creating new historic districts. I always remember what Ben Baffer said, that our pull up here is not to say no, but to find a way to yes. Yeah, he did say yeah. that. All right, I have one other. Is there anything else on this? No. This what, are the, what are the next steps? Um, we want to hear what the commission has to say when we talk with them about trees and see if we can squeeze this in in the discussion, but we're likely going to have a code amendment happen. Will there be a workshop? Um, it will probably not be a workshop for you because the standards that we've already found from these other communities are so clear in support of it. It'll come before the board for a recommendation, though. And just one other question. When you said um, uh, after the election, they're going to discuss trees and residential districts, does that pertain to the memo that I'm the board sure. sent to the city commission, or is that a separate? I think it's a separate issue, but I'm sure that that memo, you know, it was provided to them. I'm sure that they will touch on that. Feel free to, I think you could renew your, you know, support of that in upcoming discussions through an email or, or whatever we could forward on if you want to send it to us. As a board or as individuals? I think if you want to do it either way, if you send it to staff, we can forward it on up so the I, chain. I would recommend as a board if that's something that you guys want to renew as a board. Mm -hmm. But I, I know, Mr. Chart, I've seen you at commission meetings speaking, and you do know that as a resident, you can speak on topics as well. Or yes, of course, as a resident, yeah. you also could do that. But I'm just saying, it, it, as speaking as a board, it needs to come from this board director. And, and I, I think I agree with council. It would be more effective if we did it as a board. I think we sent that almost a year ago now. That was before John was on. Okay, do you mind if I move on? Please. It's, it's. <laughs> Did we say that unanimously? I think you. Please. I think it's clear that you want, you're asking about the memo and we'll run that up the chain. Sorry, if, if they want to renew the memo, I think that they should make a motion. I, th I thought the question was, will the memo be discussed at that meeting? And that was the question that we were going to ask. Oh, okay. Both of those things are true. I, okay. I think we're also discussing whether or not to renew the... Oh, I'm sorry. Decision. I misunderstood that. I would like to see it at some point. Okay. I will send it to all of you on your city emails. Um, and if at this point, you know, you decide you want to renew it, that's fine. We can resend it. Can we just each reply to you, yes, that we do want that? Yeah. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> no, because no. It, it would need to come out of a motion out of this board during a meeting otherwise so, you know she's yeah. communicating so the will of the board um based so on just she emails it and we i see what you mean review it because i forgot what the memo said mm -hmm. you probably have never seen yeah, the memo then, so at our next board we'll just vote yeah. so if you email it to us then at the next and you'll vote on we'll, next we'll, time we'll, yes okay Perfect. sounds like a plan can you also email the powerpoint presentation yes i believe i can it may come as a pdf if that's okay Okay, so now you can move okay, on. Sorry. All right, so I just wanted to give you an update of Sunday Village. So for those of you who have been in and around that general area, um, probably have seen or probably more likely heard the construction that's ongoing. They are pile driving, and I'll show you pictures for what. 
uh, pardon my punctuation on that date up there, but February 22nd was the groundbreaking ceremony. So the, their houses were moved around on the site and then they began their groundbreaking. So these are photographs from that event. And then what I'm going to do here is gonna, it's a time-lapse video, so it's gonna move kind of fast and I can slow it down if you wanna take a closer look at it. But this is of the house moves. And you're gonna see the little green building slide in there and then the building next to the rectory moves over next to that. Um, so the adjustments on the site for those buildings have been made and that was to facilitate for those who maybe aren't familiar with the specifics of the project. This is a um, multi-block project. I'm probably speaking mostly to Mr. Heredia because I don't know how closely you followed this. Um, yeah. <laughs> So it's a multi-block project. This is the entire block that's pretty much highlighted here um, on the screen, plus the Sunday house, plus the blocks to the east of the Sunday house. And so uh, it goes from over here, down, around, and over. So those houses were shifted in the block in order to make way for the underground drainage vault that's being installed as a result of the underground parking garage. So I just just to give you some updates, these are a few photographs. This is the underground drainage vault. I found it very interesting, um, the size of it. I knew it was going to be big, but when I saw the people in the photograph, I had no idea how big and deep this is going, is, is. So this is happening um, and they're moving right along. So you can see around the edge of that, those, these metal, um, piles here that is sheet piles so that noise that you're hearing around the site those are what are being driven into the ground so that's it I just wanted to give you a quick update on what's happening with that project it's moving moving along that's all I have I have a small update um, this was adopted back in September of 2022 but because we have a new board member and I, I'm not sure John, you might have predated this or postdated this. It's pretty close, but um, they adopted a new ordinance related to board attendance. Um, previously, it was three or more consecutive, and I believe it was five or more in a one-year period. Now it is three or more consecutive regular meetings or absence from at least 30% or more of the regular scheduled meetings so I just wanted to make you guys aware of it um, so you understand you know it is like an automatic removal if if you're not meeting those requirements so I just want everybody to be aware of them so that, you know. is that within a calendar year or rolling 12 months it is it's 12 it's a rolling 12 months so it's 12 month period from the most recent absence so if we have 12 a year 30% or more would be, uh, what, four absentees, mm -hmm. yeah. right? So yeah. four in rolling 12 months and you're out. Okay. Pretty clear. Noted. So we will send you that ordinance are update any, on are email. Are there any a, uh, absences that are um, excused? Excused. No. 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 Like COVID? Like if you had COVID? It, it's no, actually just straight across the board. I think it, it's difficult to evaluate on a staff level to decide which ones are yeah, important allowed. enough to meet that and which ones aren't, you know, so yeah. I think we just have a straight across the board and, you know, it's for unfortunate reasons. Unfortunately, it still ends up with the same result. So we will send you that attendance ordinance, the policy on the city email and the, along with the landscape memo in preparation for the next meeting. Um, I don't think there's anything else I'm supposed to send. I think that was it. Oh, and the PowerPoint for the landscape. Okay. April 5th, our next meeting. Welcome, Ivan. Thank you. Welcome, yes, welcome. to the fire. Yeah, this yeah. is an exciting one. Yes, yeah. welcome to the board. I Thank wanted you. to raise an issue or a point. Sure. Are you, are you trying to move on or? You, whatever you like. This is well, board member comments, yes, number sir. 27 on my list, so. Okay, I just wanted to make sure we weren't about to close the meeting. No. Oh, yeah. 
Go ahead. Well, it's it's actually me and Rhonda. Um, the Historic Preservation Trust forwarded a resolution to us. Uh, we and you've all received this. I'm just uh, putting it forward. Uh, Price uh, Patton, the chairman, uh, has drafted a letter uh, asking us to send a letter in conformance with a uh, unanimous uh, motion that we made back in, I believe, November. And I just would like to put it out there that uh, to discuss. When did you get that? There's been some big changes in the okay. last in the uh, last it week. Was discussed Tuesday. Okay, so day. this is uh, prior to that. Right. So, if I, I hope I'm getting this right, but if I understand what's happened, is the whole thing. Came, it was. It, this is about Carver. Yes. So uh, the Delray Beach Preservation Trust, which I'm on the executive board, um, agreed to be the uh, lead uh, 5013C uh, to if the school board would give the property or at least three buildings that were deemed historic to the city of Delray Beach, then we would be the lead in writing grants and getting the money toward renovating and preserving those buildings in, at the Carver campus. So we pretty much had everything in place and basically the school board said, we're not giving anything away, sorry. So there is no more. It's gone. That project's gone. However, they did say they were open to historic designation, weren't they? Hmm. I didn't hear that. I, I wasn't hmm. in, I didn't go so to that. This meeting. topic was discussed at, I believe, last week's city commission meeting. The so. workshop, I believe, they discussed. Or... Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it, it would be worth going back and listening to that meeting before you maybe as a board direct a letter to be written because the city commission is very well aware of the board's wishes mm -hmm. and their wishes are the same but we can't force the school district to That's give us the property or correct. to make it historic or to do anything what the school district has committed to is not demolishing the buildings they have not committed to preservation of the buildings so I, I might go back and listen to that workshop. I believe it was last Tuesday at the 3.30 meeting. It was I think that's about right. Uh, yeah. I, I was at that meeting, and it was brought up by Commissioner Johnson. Mm -hmm. And That's different. There was a second one. There was a second one. There was an actual workshop. Discussing. On Carver. Yeah. Yes, oh. sir. point that she made was that the city commission... Uh, apparently had been had not been clear in their intent about those buildings and the desire for the city to own them that was and flushed the, out a bit at the workshop okay and what was the result of the workshop we we want to do what we can do but we can't force the school district to do any of that so the commission is fully committed to having something happen so I, I would suggest listening to the workshop and if you want to discuss again at our next meeting I, I don't know that it would be a bad idea to send a memo but the, the Commission is aware they they want the they want the project they want something to happen we might want to be on record with regard to it so we have been on record in the past which is how all of this came about and is in conversation. It might have been before you were on the board, um, but you know, you certainly could discuss it again. Some people indicated that they've kind of worked on this for the last six years, at least two years, very diligent, very diligently. Mm -hmm. Our, our uh, board has you know, we've paid for people to come in and advise us. We've done as much 
as so the records clear if you just refer to it as you know the historic preservation trust and you know when you're saying our board because it i'm sorry when the um the preservation trust the pre the yes preservation trust delray beach preservation trust board um it, it, so at that level our board was totally our, our preservation trust board was committed and we worked very diligently to um, educate the commissioners and we thought that they were all on board uh, we paid for advice the delray beach preservation trust paid for advisors they paid for architectural drawings um, and all of that the rug was pulled out from under the Delray Beach Preservation Trust and I think the city too when the school board decided they're not giving anything away if you'd like to watch a meeting it's on it was on February 21st 20 okay. thank you Kelly At three o'clock There are some really great opportunities. I mean, I was hopeful when I had heard that about the Preservation Trust because um, I've seen the grant opportunities come across email. Not only are there cultural opportunities that are related to black history, but there are some grants about equal rights and affirmative action, which absolutely would have applied for this project. We applied for three grants before this happened even. But you can't get that funding without consent and you also have to have adaptive reuse plans but there were some discussions about that at that workshop so i think it's valuable maybe we can all as a group i'll look i'll go back and make notes to rewatch that workshop and then we could touch on this again at our next meeting to see if do you want to do anything um in particular to <coughs> opinion if on you memo. see any other projects that you think uh, have merit along those lines that maybe are not in the historic <coughs> district at this time that, so. yeah we have quite a long list of projects that i try to communicate through the preservation trust and the historical society because we're losing stuff every day and we just got an email about another one possibly to be demolished that's not protected so i mean we're we just have a list that we have to work at the highest priorities and right now those priority those aren't priorities we need the nonprofits <laughs> working on those efforts and and helping staff on those efforts if we can't save a building in place maybe something could be moved you know so there's there's a lot of opportunities i think it was joy howell and winnie and i had a meeting a long time ago about this but winnie too has a long list of things so there's so much. I'm so proud of Delray Beach and all that they have been doing. Um, the support of our commission and historic preservation efforts has made our jobs more rewarding in that we know our efforts aren't fruitless. You know, so it's we're we're working on quite. A, I wish I could. Sh I, maybe Anthony and I have talked about doing a state of the department with the list <laughs> of all the stuff we've done because we've done quite a bit. There is the related item of TDRs and air rights that we have talked about here too. And Anthea, uh, I, you were out and Anthea addressed them as another way to save historic buildings or historic parcels or neighborhoods that would not require, at least in theory, all of the. Uh, effort that goes into setting up a historic district but still save the buildings there is a TDR section in the code we actually had an internal <laughs> discussion about it this week because it's one of the items we're reviewing as part of incentives in relation to the Atlantic Avenue historic district um, right. it's 4620 LDR section 4620 it is not going to apply for the way we need it to be used so that would have to be revised which is going to obviously require some direction from commission, mm. ultimately on receiving sites. Yes. So it's absolutely a good incentive, but you know that that would have to have commission support. Yeah, and we certainly couldn't do that on our own, but um, I think oh, that no, has I been mean, presented to the city manager and uh, and Thea spoke about it positively. The assistant city manager has done it in. Uh, I believe Miami Beach. So there is experience. Yeah, uh, 
and Thea's talked about how it was applied in West Palm Beach and the mm-hmm. receiving sites. And once you went through, you didn't even have to go through a you know particular process to register that you were using them because they were already a bank on this site over here. So there are great examples to draw from. Is there anything else? Since our Who's chairman is gone. They can adjourn for us. I like to adjourn the meeting. Yeah, Been go. waiting to do that. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for Thank you, everybody. all that you are doing. Thank you. I don't like doing that gavel anyway. You too.